Tell that guy, get cut up. He wants to see Mike the Mouth. What are you doing? Welcome to the Mouthpiece. Episode 14, year one. Today, part two of an amazing interview with Sean Deeb, as well as taking some of your phone calls and talking about my week on Poker After Dark. So stay tuned, part two, here on The Mouth. In session two, that was um, really interesting. Uh, I knew the game was going to play way bigger and I was prepared to sell half of myself um, to Phil Hamuth because uh, I knew the game was just going to play like a 100, 200 or maybe even a 2, 400 no limit which it did it played almost as big as probably 2, 4 uh, but when the draw came I had position on Berkey and Randall Emmett, right to Randall Emmett's left. And I said to myself, man, that's a good seat draw. This is, they're going to be mixing it up a lot and all opposition. I don't really, uh, I, I, I think I don't need to sell half of myself. So I decided, now I had the money to, to, to play. It's just, you know, I, you guys know the story. I've been broke many times and I finally, you know, I had a decent World Series where I got some money in my pocket and I don't, want to go broke again i mean it's you know you you're 50 years old and you have to get a learning you have to learn sooner or later and i think i figured it out a little bit late but i figured it out so you know i want you know i want to protect my bankroll so but when i got position i decided to play for myself and uh if you haven't seen what happened um i get stacked against brandon who this was about the 12th hand in brandon had played all 11 hands he had called any amount of raise on all 11 hands and um i decided to uh he had sleeper straddle on it and i raised it up with seven five of clubs and in the sleeper straddle he three bet me to 1500 now Brandon, for some reason, when even though this hand I didn't really have anything, but every time I raised under the gun, which I think I had a top five percent hand, Brandon would three bet me to fifty. It would go call, re-raise fifteen hundred or whatever. The bottom line is, is the night before I picked up a tell on Brandon when I was sitting in seat eight. And I knew every time he was strong and when he was weak. So, but was sit, sitting in seat three and Brandon at seat six, I could not get that read off him uh, that I had gotten the night before, which was really kind of upset me. It was like an angle where I could not see the tell that I had picked up. It was on the other side of his body when he put the chips in. So uh, I don't really want to tell him what it was because we're going to be playing a lot together, including next week. So um, so he re-raises, and now Randall calls 1,500 cold. Now Randall's playing pretty deep. I just uh, – uh, I'm in for 10, and um, I – oh, I'm sorry. This is after I got stacked. I apologize. Uh, the first one – I got stacked. Uh, uh, same thing kind of happened uh, with I. I, I uh, uh, Brandon was on the straddle. Uh, Randall Emmett called. Somebody else called. I call out of the small blind at uh, the two hundred with Jack Nine of Clubs. Then, um, since nobody raised, and every time nobody raised, Brandon would think everybody's weak, and he would just bomb re-raise whatever and he did it over and over so he makes it 1500 randall calls and i call um i'm not proud of this hand i think it's the worst played hand i played the entire two days um not how i played it post i just don't need to i have nothing in the pot i don't need to play out of position with jack nine of clubs but every time Randall gets in there, it's like, uh, okay, uh, I got to call. So now the flop comes 
10, 7, ace. Uh, two diamonds and a club. Uh, I check. And um, Brandon bets 1,200. 1,200 into 4,500. Now, normally Brandon likes to bet real big when he has a big hand or when he has nothing. Uh, so small sizing made me think he was huge or he was super weak. So I decided to call the 1200 uh, on a gutter ball. Now the board pairs a seven and I decide to lead out for 1200. Now Brandon knows that I'm very tight and I use my image. Well, he doesn't, he's finding out now how I use my image, but uh, I decided to lead out for 1200. And now Brandon calls. Now he knows I easily could have ace, queen, ace, king. Uh, but my lead out, you know, once he calls 1200, I'm done. The hand's over. Uh, and we're off to the next hand because he has at least an ace at this point. And he's calling me down. And lo and behold, the death card comes, the eight on the river, which makes me a straight. And I check it to Brandon, who then moves in for 5,500, and I snap call him, and he shows me 10's full. Now, here's a guy that played 11 straight hands with 10-5 off, jack-6 off, every dog shit hand you could think. But he's on the straddle, and somehow an 8 rolls off, and I make a straight, and he has 10's full, and I get stacked. 12 hands in, I'm 10,000 loser. Now, I hated everything about the way I played the hand. I did what you're not supposed to do, which is if a guy is playing every hand, he's picking up dog shit, 100, 150, just let him keep it and wait. When you get a, when you get a hand, you just destroy him. And uh, so by calling the 1500 Jack Diana clubs was a terrible call. I uh, hated everything about it. It's a, it's a fold 100 out of 100 times. Uh, Post flop, I actually like the way I played it. I, I like the call and I like the lead uh, because if he can't beat an ace, he's, yeah, I'm going to win it right there. And, you know, I get in a kind of cheap. Uh, and then I just get unlucky and eight hits and it costs me 5,500. So I'm 10 grand loser uh, right away. Now, uh, you know, again, I'm folding every hand. Uh, Brandon's raising every hand. And uh, I decided to... Uh, open under the gun with uh, seven five of clubs. Now, this is, if you watch the entire show, you will, it's the only time I open with dog shit under the gun. Uh, you know, I've been folding a lot. I was using my image. And uh, the guy next to me calls. And then Brandon makes it his normal 1500. Every time I raise under the gun and somebody next to me called, Brandon would make it 15 or 1,800, 100 out of 100 times he did it. So uh, he did it again. He makes it like 1,800. And I am learn. I learned my lesson from the first one. He made it, that was 1,650 he made it, I think. But Mr. Randall Emmett jumps all in for 1,650. And I know fucking Brandon has dog shit. I told myself... Just fucking four bet this shit all in right here. You're just going to pick it up. And I, I, then I changed my mind and decided to call. Now, if Randall didn't come in, I was just going to lose the, the 300 and be done with it. Randall comes in, makes me call 1200 more, or I think it's 1250 more. And the flop comes down. Ten seven five of diamonds, and I had like fifty four hundred again left in front of me, or six thousand, and I just move in, and uh, Brandon snap folds because he had dog shit, and of course, uh, lo and behold, Brandon Limit somehow caught with nothing in the pot, called sixteen hundred with six eight of diamonds, and flopped the flush, and I get stacked again, and so now I'm twenty thousand loser. And the needling starts. Uh, Randall starts the needling. Um, and Brandon starts the needling. And you know, me and Brandon are really close friends. And he tried to pile it on me. And I got kind of upset with him and said, you know, 
lay, lay off. Lo and behold, now I'm 20,000 loser. And the, the piling on starts. Um, it's okay. I, I dish it out. I could take it. But I think Brandon got a little bit too much trying to thinking he could tilt me and he, he never going to tilt me in poker, especially when I'm playing uh, for my life. I mean, I'm not giving away anything and I need to stay focused. I told him to lay off a little bit. Now, there came up a hand where I was probably 75% folding anyways, but it went raise and re-raise. Uh, of course, it's Brandon raising, re-raise by Randall. And I got two sevens. I'm in the uh, small blind or big blind, one of the two. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, and I, I'm trying to get a read. And I'm, I'm, I thought... I thought that uh, Randall was pretty strong. I thought Branham was pretty weak. Uh, but I wasn't quite sure. And there's no reason, just come 20 loser, to tilt on in for 1,500 preflop. Uh, but I was thinking about it because these two goofballs never have anything. But you are out of position and two sevens. If you don't flop a set, you're kind of fucked. And I'm... I'm only playing in a ten thousand deep. Uh, Boss had thirty thousand on table. I was fucking called. So, and then Randall gets in my face. Why are you so slow? So I did something already. And, you know, they're just really riding me hard. And I just folded and laughed. Um, and of course, then Brandon just rips it in. Four bit rips it in. And uh, of course. Uh, uh, Randall calls and uh, Brandon's got uh, Jack Queen and uh, Randall's got Ace Queen and um, of course the flop comes uh, Queen 6-7 or we wouldn't be talking about this hand uh, and it kind of really I didn't realize a, set, a 7 even flop somebody brought it up afterwards and uh, I really wasn't thinking about it but the point was is like I lost Tony Loser. Randall's riding me hard. I'll fold, do something already. And Brandon's piling it on. But I was going to fold like 85% anyways. But it, and you, you need some time to like try and look at your opponents. I mean, it's just not fucking online poker where you, you do whatever. You know, you got to look for strength or weakness. But um, anyway, so Randall wins this hand. And uh, he was on his way talking shit. Then all of a sudden... I mean, Randall gets winner. He plays tight, and he does, tries to play good. And when he's loser, he plays bad and tries to give his money away. Uh, Brandon, he tries as hard as he can to give his money away every single hand. And um, sometimes he's capable of playing well, but when he's stuck, he's not. When he's winner, he you know, just like the rest of everybody, they all they can never get stuck and grind out like I do because I I try and play better. You don't you ain't gonna get winner playing bad when you're stuck or get even. You're gonna get out by staying focused and grinding. So anyways to make a long story short, um I lost another five thousand because I thought this was a mistake I made. I thought Randall had had a uh, uh, straddled for 300 under the gun because he had done that like three times. And so I had ace nine off in the two hole and then I just raised it to like uh, 1,200 and then everybody folded and Randall called and the flop came down. Queen, eight, four with two spades. Randall checked. I bet half pot. He called. Now I know, I just know he doesn't have a queen. I'm a hundred percent. He doesn't have a queen. A matter of fact, I thought he had like Jack ten. Uh, so uh, now the turn card comes. Uh, let me see if I get this right. That's what it is. The turn card paired the board to bottom pair, and Randall check, and I, I bomb it. I bet thirty five hundred. Uh, this uh, leaves me. Uh, like 5,000 less behind. And I, I I was pretty locked in, so I was pretty confident in my read. And then Randall calls 3,500. And now I'm like, 
I'm done with it. I'm like, I guess my read's wrong. I guess he has a queen or maybe a good eight that he doesn't want to fold. But I think to me he would have folded an eight. Anyways, the river card comes like a five of spades and he just goes all in. And I mean, he's never bluffing here. I just fold my hand. And when we look back at the hand, he uh, he had three seven of spades. Uh, so my re-raise, even though I didn't see him raise under the gun with seven three, I, I mean, I ended up getting 1,200 in pre with ace nine versus seven three. I then on the flop bet 1,200 with ace high which was good and I even bombed the turn 3500 with when I'm ahead and when he gets there and he goes all in I folded so the next thing I knew I'm like 31,000 loser and I then pull out another 10 and this is as deep as I was going uh, and I end up grinding back and I end up losing 6300 for the session but I played extremely well to grind back. So many people that watched the stream or my Twitter or whatever said they were so impressed how I kept my composure and how I grinded out. And uh, I mean, even Daniel texted me to tell me that I got a lot of heart and he was really proud of me for grinding out and keeping my composure and he really liked the way I played. And that felt good coming from him also. So um, we end that game and we're done and everybody just uh, they're talking about eating dinner and then meeting up at uh, 10 30 and playing again and so i'm like i'm in you know and it was gonna be me randall emmett um sam Soverall, and uh brandon so i go home to unwind instead of eat and all of a sudden I'm in pain, and I hadn't been in pain in a while. So uh, I'm kind of laying down there and just trying to get myself together. And they start the game at like 10.30. And they're like, are you coming? And I'm like, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming. And then all of a sudden I just force myself to get down there. And I get down there 45 minutes after the game starts. And I just know... Brandon is going to give it away. I just know he's going to try and run over me, Sam, and and Randall. I get there, and uh, 40, 45 minutes late, Brandon's 40,000 loser already. 45 minutes. They told me it was quarter 50 with a 10K max buy-in, and I get there 45 minutes after it starts, and it's 100-100, and you can buy in for whatever you want. Now, obviously, it's because Brandon's buried and I me and Randall kind of got in a fight I'm just like oh well you told me it was quarter 50 he starts screaming at me why well, we changed it if you don't like it get him fuck up behind I told him Randall we're friends don't you ever talk down to me I don't give a fuck how rich you are don't you dare talk down to me and he apologized and uh, I sat down in the game and there was another person in the game also and the game lasted 20 minutes uh, and I ended up winning 10,000 in the game in 20 minutes. Uh, Brandon gave me like 6,500. I had the nuts straight and he just bombed every street like he always does. And I just call him down. It's so if he doesn't like make the bottom line, now he was completely like off his, he was out of his mind. Uh, and then another guy uh, somehow called a, a, 500 raise preflop out of the small blind with four seven suited. I don't even know what the guy's name was. I forgot. He was just, he didn't have much money. He saw the game and I guess he bought in, bought in for like 10 and he had like five. So I call the raise two or playing five and flop comes three, four, five. I had pocket threes and he just, he just moves in for 4,500 on a three, four, five, two diamond board flop right in a, like three callers, me, Brandon, and I think Randall called. And I said, I called. They both fold. And he shows seven, four suited. I'm just like, really? This guy has no money here. And he calls 500 of his 5,000 and then moves in 4,500 on the flop with seven, four. So I win that hand. And then I went, and then Brandon decides to 
call a huge re-raise by Sam Savrall at two nines in the Flopcom 8-7 deuce. And um, Sam bed, and uh, of course Brandon just moves in for like 8,000. And Sam calls him with the two nines, and Brandon has like an eight. I go, we go eight what? He goes, I got an eight. So I presume it was probably like a eight queen offsuit or eight queen suit or some dog shit. So he gets stacked game breaks. And uh, Brandon, in an hour after winning 66,000 in two sessions of Poker After Dark, lost 60,000 in an hour and 45 minutes in the side game over at Caesars. I got 10 of it. Um, Randall got like 30, I think, or 25, and then Sam got the other 25 or whatever. So that was it. So I ended up for the two days actually profiting 3700 But the, the kicker was I didn't give Phil half when I got buried and grinded out, yet um, – it's pretty funny when I, I knew this four handed game is going to play even bigger, especially with, with, uh, Brandon stuck. And so I called Phil, I go, uh, Phil, you want to buy half of me in this game? Uh, and Phil originally turns me down and says, well, you've been playing a long time. I go, Phil, I'm locked it. And Brandon's giving it away. He goes, eh, I'm going to pass. I said, okay, if you want, you can buy, have a third of me too. He goes, nah, I'm going to pass. So, uh, you know, so I, when I first sit down, I play uh, like one round, and all of a sudden I get a phone call back from Phil. He goes, "Did you play anything yet?" I like, I just played my blinds. I'm like 300 loser. He goes, "I changed my mind. I'll take a third of you." I said, "You got it." So of course I win 10,000, and so the 3,700 profit that I had for the two days went to Phil. This is how good Phil runs. He had to call me back after turning me down. Why? So you have to call me back. I would have had thirty seven hundred more dollars in my pocket. So I end up breaking even for the two days, anyways. And good old white magic Phil found a way to hit the redial and pick up thirty seven hundred bucks. So that's what's going on in my life. Um, I will be playing poker after dark Monday, Tuesday of next week. So uh, if you're listening to this podcast, tune in to Poker Go uh, and Monday. It'll be at 3 p.m., I think, 3 to 8 or 2.30 to 8. Uh, and it's uh, called The Missing Man Week, uh, where there is uh, six of us and one random person off the Internet will be invited to play in this game. Uh, it's supposed to be great. Uh, me, Brandon, can too. I told him Brandon had to play. Uh, and he said he's got a couple of real juicy businessmen lined up. So I'm looking forward to maybe picking up 50000 here Monday, Tuesday. Let's hope so. Keep this roll going. Keep everything going well. So that's up, uh, what's up with me. Um, and uh, coming up next, uh, our interview with Mr. Marka Police himself, Sean D. We'll be back on the mouthpiece the mouthpiece if you'd like to take part in our phone call segment you can give us a call at 702-329-0480 and if you're a snowflake or a pussy and you don't want to talk to me you can email me at mouthpiecepodcast at gmail.com also follow me at the mouth Madiso on twitter for times that our call in segment will be live. Okay, it's our favorite time of the show, our phone call segment. So call on in and light up the line. Yo, this is Mike. Welcome to the mouthpiece. Hey, Mike the Mouth. Are you one of my all time favorite poker players? What's going on, man? Oh, I don't know. Just chilling and. I, don't, I, I saw the pic- I saw the picture you posted. Would you win a tournament somewhere? I want a little a little charity tournament, like a thirty player t- charity tournament. Um, it was fun though. I mean, it hey, that's cool. It wasn't for much money. I won like twenty six hundred, uh, but it was you know uh, over half went to charity, and it uh, uh, it just it feels it feels good when you 
you know, you know, uh, let's see, my last four No Limit tournaments, I think I finished uh, 27th, 30th, uh, 199th in the main event uh, out of two eight out of nine thousand and then i win i win one so my um i i know my no limit game is really really good right now and uh well, well you know what mike let me just say i i honestly think you're underappreciated because it, first of all you made the world series of poker final table three times i don't think anyone's ever done that in the history of the world series of poker. yeah it was actually twice but i i i've been in the last 30 people three times and you know, I've made the top hundred like four or five which or is un- which is unbelievable and and yeah. you know and my well the reason I, I called in the main question I have for you this is sort of a little mm. about poker but similar the high stakes poker cash games that were on television I loved watching them I wish mm. they would bring them back watching everybody play for big money right. cash games I well, don't know why uh, they stopped it. Well, they they uh, do you have a Poker Go subscription? I mean, do you watch? I on do po- not. Well, that's where it's all at. Every the, I'm I actually played last week, and I'm playing this Tuesday, Wednesday on Poker Go. So uh, when you sign up uh, to Poker Go, put a note that I referred you to uh, to them. Uh, so that'll oh okay, that's good for me. Okay. And uh, but uh, I'll be. Playing- Are you playing? I'm playing this Tuesday. Oh, sorry, go Wednesday. Ahead. I'm playing this Tuesday, Wednesday uh, on Poker Go, um, and uh, the game should be really good. Mike, I got one more question for you before I go. Yeah. Um, there was a cash, a uh, bunch of cash games. Uh, they were on television years ago. I don't remember what it was. It was some kind of thing you played in Europe with a bunch of guys. I think Phil only paid one. Yeah, played one that was the, you won some that, good money. That was late night poker in London that we used to uh, record for. That was the one that I, I know you you did pretty you did pretty good. I think I don't if I yeah, remember correctly. I was, the I first season you got screwed by Seidel because he he yeah. got a better two pair on the river. Yeah, that but was. But then a afterwards nice you did pretty good. Yeah, uh, that was um, the last year I became real negative. I was, you know, I was running really bad. And then I when I lose that hand for like a hundred and eighty thousand, whatever it was. I was just like, I'm the most unluckiest person in the world, you know. And then I kind of went and kind of got some some self-help books on staying positive. And then after that, I just crushed. So, uh, you know. I know you did it. And you know, Mike, to be perfectly honest with you, if I'm going to be honest, I kind of like it when the mouth gets a little crazy. I kind of get pumps me up when you tell somebody (laughs) that they're playing like shit. <laughs> yeah, and then we had. I brought the donkey out for Tom Dwan. That was, I think, that was. Oh, the, last the donkey one was like, great. The donkey was hilarious. Yeah, I the worst. The worst. When you beat Patrick Antonio for that one, and you put the donkey out, mm-hmm. <laughs> you look at Phil Ivey like, "Oh my God, what am I doing?" Yeah, the worst <laughs> thing I ever did was give that donkey away to some girl. Man, I forgot what girl I gave it to, but it was. Uh, oh, man. you could have kept that. You could have kept well, that. It would have yeah, been hilarious. I think it was some girl I wanted to fuck and didn't work out so well. So, oh, you got to find out where did you buy that thing? You got to find the document. Yeah, that again and bring I, it to the next I, I bought place. it in the streets of France. Uh, it was, I bet, if they, oh, wow. I bet they're still selling it right there in Nice. Really nice area. I bet they're like you could probably. They had like four or five different ones. I said, "Oh, this will work for TV," so I bought it. My only disappointment was fucking sell, uh, giving it to this girl, thinking for sure I could fuck her and motherfucking got. You know, I got, you know, I got, I got stiff. I got stiff. No, no pun intended. <laughs> I got a lot of calls coming in. I got to answer them. Thanks for the call. Keep in touch. All, All right, Mike. Nice talking to you. You got it. Bye. Yo, welcome to the mouthpiece. This is Mike. Mike, yo, hey, hey, how's it going, my I man? In the main, I played in the main event and I made the money bubble. I, you were one table away from me, and I got to tell you, I, I still am trying to figure out what it was that you were upset about. Okay, so that's why I'm calling. I'll yeah. tell you what I was upset about. Okay, uh, every tournament. Uh, well, you you know you played the main event. The first the money bubble yeah. was day what, day three. Okay, yep. so every tournament. In the entire World Series, whether it's a main event yeah. or side tournament, uh, at the end of the night, when you get to 10 minutes left on the clock, they draw mm-hmm. for how many more hands we have left, okay? Yep. So I remember. at the end yeah. of the night, when the money bunny broke, okay, 
there was six minutes and 52 seconds left on the clock in which I said, and they said, we're done for the night. I said, we're not done for the night. I just paid my blinds. You have to draw how many hands we have left. There was still 650 on the clock. Right. And I was going absolutely crazy. Now, even if (laughs) I I didn't just pay my blinds, let's say I had the blind next. I would have been going just as crazy for other people because it's not fair. You have to draw for the same amount of hands like we do every other night. And I went crazy and I texted Jack and I went off the rails and I'm (laughs) and. I'm 100% responsible for at least them putting the six minutes and 52 seconds back on the clock for day four. Okay. They weren't yes, even going are. to do that. Absolutely. So I just yeah. want you to know that that, even though the consolation was them putting that time back on the clock, which is fine, but it doesn't change the people that just paid their blinds or were going to pay their blinds the night before. And you can't change a structure that's been in place in every poker tournament for the last 10 years. That's what took me off the rails. So all of, and, and, and it is, that's the case with all the tournaments, not just the main. Right. All the tournaments. Yeah. 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 Well, they, they, uh, I guess they just were trying to end it quickly. Well, this is what had happened. And this is what I was told. Okay. They didn't think the money bubble was going to break that night. Okay. And they had nobody in the cashiers if to start cashing people out in the line you see oh. what I'm saying? even in the last six minutes after the money buddy breaks they probably lose 20 people and they had nobody oh, yeah. there so they decided we're done for the night and he explained it to me and after he explained it to me and he promised he'd put the six minutes and 52 seconds back on the clock uh that that calmed me down <laughs> It okay, still well, been no, the that other way. really helps explain things. Yeah, it yeah, still should have been the other way, but but that made me that I think that was fair and and a very fair assessment yeah. of why they did it. And as long as he put the at least put the, the time back on the clock, I was good with it. So that was the whole story. I appreciate it. Well, you that got, was my first main event, and you got I, it. I'm uh, glad you cashed five percent. I'm glad you cashed. Uh, That's awesome. You, and, Man, it was an experience of a lifetime. Yeah. By the way, I got your autograph. Oh, that's I great. I mention that, too. Yeah. I appreciate that, too. And keep yeah, keep man. tuning into the Mouthpiece podcast and keep keep checking out our video vlogs, and I appreciate the call and uh, everything else. Sure will. All Thank right, you very care. much. You got it. Bye-bye. All right, Mike. Bye. The Mouthpiece. This is Billy Baxter, and you listen to the mouthpiece. What would you say is the most disappointing tournament for you at the World Series this year? Was it finishing second to Adam? or? What, what, oh, no, the main event. I just was in a bad spot mentally. I was stressed out. Had a big party at Frank's. Uh, dropped uh, off my wife and kids yeah, before day one. I saw you had big chips. And I just, I, I wasn't in the mood to play, and I wasn't in the mood to try. And, like, I gave it away. And, you know, that's the term you try your hardest not to give away. Right. But, you know, that's one of the three terms I punted, you know, and I, right. I didn't even punt that bad. I, like, got short, ran about twice, and, like, I just kept, you know, having unfortunate hands go down. Right. And it's always the one you get affected the most on because it's the one that really can change your life, you know. Absolutely. For me, thankfully, I'm in a good enough place financially where most of the tournaments that I win or lose, it's not going to affect me. Right. But that's the one where if you win, you know, that really brings you another tier of financial well-being. Absolutely. Um, you know. So that's, like the one that I'm most mad about, but, you know, I sucked it up and I played the postlands. I played well and, you know, I had a good shot to win a lot of money in the close. I had a good shot in another thing that was a postlim and that's what I do. You know, I, yeah. I get right back on the saddle. Yeah. And you know, I, when you say that, I look back at, uh, two things. I'll look back at the 2006 main event, uh, where I punted. I have never, it was the only day I'd ever got knocked out on day one of the main event. I, I tell people, if you get knocked out on day one of the main event, I, you're just not playing well. Because it, even set against set, I mean, when you're playing, they give you all these chips. I mean, it's easy to just check, call, check, call. And, you know, you're not going to go broke because people are like, oh, well, what's he going to call me? And they're not betting that much. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I think it's really hard to go broke on day one if you're playing well. Uh, so I punted it. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, my whole life, all I think about was the main event. So I said, fuck it. I'm going to go punish myself. 
go across the street. I played the Bellagio Cup in 2007 and got second to Kevin Saul. And I was so proud of myself because I was so mad I punted that event. Now, I go, I, I relate that back to, I had one punt this year. I think we already talked about it with, in the 10K PLO 8 or better, which I live for that tournament every year. And I punted. And I'm, I was so in shell shock of how poorly I played that I came back to stud eight and and put my head down and like even david baker when he won the limit hold him and he saw me at the final table of stud eight he goes you know i knew you were going to be have a shot to win this tournament he goes i knew you were going to come back with a vengeance because you were so pissed how bad you punted because he was at my table and i punted the plo8 and um that's what you have to do in poker you can't just ride how unlucky you are oh i played up tournament bad you have to own up to it and then get back on the saddle, like you said. And that's it's the most important thing to do. Okay, so uh, we have some call-ins. Uh, we're going to play them for you, and uh, you can answer them the best way you can. Go ahead, Danny. A lot okay, of first of all, Mike, I want to ask you, how's your dad? And second question for Sean Deeb. Um, you were there last year. I was on the rail with you for Tony Miles, and I wanted to ask you what you think is the reason why so many players who had made the money last year or in the past, especially on the final table, didn't even make the cut this year. It can't be that there's that many players, really? Or is it just that much of a crapshoot? Like Doyle Brunson says, it's like winning the lottery. Want to know your thoughts? And okay. here's Mike. Thank Hi. you. Thank you so much. Um, my dad is doing much better. He's been out of the hospital now for since april he was there for four months uh he's getting strong again i appreciate you thinking about him and he's doing much better uh as far as that question goes you can go ahead and answer that sean so the main event is such a unique beast you know the people who get top nine of eight thousand person tournaments it's tough to get back there i mean yeah. there's been only a few people have gone back to back been let you know been there twice it's just mm -hmm. so tough and a lot of people like like we talk about being hungry. Mm -hmm. They were so hungry that first year, and that's why you see so many first timers make the final table with poor results because they're not, you know, giving away their stack. But a lot of people who have a good result and the table, they think people are gunning for them. So mentally, they think people are, you know, lighter than they are, bluffing them more, or calling them down more because they saw them bluff, and they change their game based on how they're perceived on TV. Right. And, you know, that's something that I had to adjust a lot from online because everyone played with me online. I was like, well, I don't know who they are, and they know who I am. So I definitely leveled myself a lot thinking people were, you know, rebluffing me because they've seen me do that so many times. So that's kind of it's it's tough when you go from being complete unknown to people now knowing everything about you, you know, your bust out hand, your biggest wins, your big bluff, you know, there so you just kind of have to adjust your style based on what your perceived image is. You know, Mike's a good example of that. He talks about how much his game has changed over the years because everyone's seen tens of you know hundreds of hands that he's played mm -hmm. online or, you know, live on different streams, and you don't know what they've seen and not seen. So it's so tough. You just really have to let them adjust based on that day's play and figure out their tendencies. And, yeah, sometimes someone will make a move just to put a bluff on you, but, oh, look, I bluffed the final table. You know, oh, I did this, and, like, I called him down. And it was great because I knew he bluffed. Like, but you can't let that affect your, you know, play because tournaments still tournaments, and you're still going to have equity – and you still got to be bluffing sometimes. You still have to fold sometimes. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And and I I brought it up to somebody. Like I had a it, it was on uh, day four of the main event, and I had a guy to my right. He had like one point two average was about I don't know maybe four hundred, and he's like raising my blind. He's he raised my blind. I don't know ten straight hands or whatever. And uh, you know I never I really didn't was never really had a a stack to really come at him but i was more and he was also raising this this older lady's blind so every time he was in the cutoff he'd raised her blind whatever so i i basically spent an hour and a half just studying him i mean he doesn't even didn't even realize that i'm just sitting there looking at him through my sunglasses every every time he's not in the hand i'm looking to find tendencies and once i find a weakness of his open and i make sure it's i'm 100 sure on the weakness uh, then I decided to attack it, and I I three bet him with seven three offsuit when he raised the weak lady's blind and uh, to seventy two thousand. 
somehow she's in the big blind and says all in and it was 45,000 more, which I had to call. I, I start laughing and I'm just like, well, uh, I'm calling. I'm like, but the worst thing about it is I don't want you guys to have to see what I'm caught, what I have here. And the whole table just bust up laughing. And I had seven, three offsuit. And it was pretty funny that she had ace jack, which, you know, she only had 121,000 left. She had 12 bigs. Uh, so she went with it. But, you know, like, like Phil was like saying, he goes, you, you're playing super nitty and you've never three betted. Now you, you three bet somebody and couldn't wait to get but I have no problem with 12 bigs in the big blind, especially, you know, she's, she's outclassed and, you know, it's the first decent hand she had to pick up. So uh, I end up losing like, uh, I think it was 121, 150,000 in a hand. And then we went on break and I see Rami Bukai and I say, tell him what happened. He starts laughing and he goes, and I was kind of mad. He goes, what are you saying, Mike? He goes, this is the best thing that could happen to you. He goes, the next time you three bet that guy, he's going to think about that seven, three hand and he might lose his mind. I'm like, well, I hope so. We go back, it was 20 minutes later and this was like the only playable hand I had on, whether it was day three or four, I forgot. Uh, we had two queens and a big blind and everybody folded and he goes, oh, let's see if we can raise Mike's blind again. I mean, and he raises my blind and I raise them to the same exact 72 plus an extra thousand. I made it 73,000 and he just four bit jam with two fives and I win half a million in chips. Just exact. that was one of my, my big no hands I won at showdown. That was exactly kind of what you were just, just kind of saying is um, it, 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 it's people think about what they've seen you do. Kind of, kind of like the ridiculous beat you took like, was it seven, eight years ago? Might have been longer now. When you had it was the, longer, yeah. Yes, yeah, I lose track of time when you had the aces versus a six. And I, I go, how the fuck does that happen? And you said to me, me and this guy have history online. And and that was pretty ugly, though. I mean, <laughs> he six bets you all in with that fucking hand. I'll never forget it. That was like one of the worst beats I you probably ever took. And uh, especially for your stack size in, at that point of the tournament of the main event, uh, right? I mean, that's probably. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of chips. It was like eight starting stacks each, you know, yeah. and we had a, but well, you look at that table now, looking at that clip, that was one of the toughest final table, like tables that you would have that early. I think it was Sammy Kapoor, Dan Legrano, me, it's uh, two other pros and like two guys who were like, ended up being pros, you know, mm -hmm. like it was a super tough table. And like, but that's the thing is like, I knew it was a tough table and I knew the main event, like you don't have, the nice thing with that structure is if you have a really shitty table on, Day one, day two, huh. you can like just survive the day. And then Thank all of a sudden, you. Like, Holy shit, still Thank space. you. I thought I listen. I tell people this all the time, and a lot of times I, I deviate away from it. But it's I, I I see my table draw, and one of the things I do whine about is I'll whine about my table draws, right? But now you know one thing I've learned uh, from the past is I don't get that good at table draws very often. I'm one, you know, some people, I'm, I'm pretty unlucky with table draws, but I tell myself, okay, this is a tough table today. Okay, I'm not gonna be able to open pots. They're gonna be three bet me a lot, flat me a lot. Uh, I've got killers behind me. This is the main event. Just go in a tight gear, get through the day. You're gonna get a better table draw tomorrow. And, and that's why you see so many people that have so few chips that 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 end up getting there like i was talking with dario uh you know going into day six he had five big blinds or six big blinds i think he told me and uh yeah six and uh the next thing you know he's at the final table with and he was what between 19 and 30 big blinds for god how I lost how many track of how many levels, whatever. And the next thing you know, he had 30, then he back to 19 and, and then he took off and he just, like he said to me, nobody understands. It's like the main event is not like any other tournament. You have 13, 15, like he said, I had 10 big blinds for so long. When I doubled up to 20, I felt like I had a hundred and that's the way I feel when I'm playing the main event. And I told him how I went broke and I was, that's the only thing I was upset about is the way I went broke. And everybody was like, ah, Mike, that's just standard. You got unlucky. And I told him, and he agreed, he was, him and Phil were, and one other person were the only ones to agree with me that they, they hated the way I went broke, which was I had 15 bigs on the button with ace, eight of spades. And 
I could min raise the button and fold in that in that event only, only in the main event. Instead of like regular, you have 15 bigs, ace eight, you just ship it on the button, you know. Uh, it depends on who's in the blinds as well and their stack size. I mean, that's a little generic what you're saying, but I do agree that there's like, you could limp it, you could min raise it, you could shove it, you know, it right. depends on how they play. And you've been playing with them all day, you've picked up their tendencies. Right. And I just hated the fact that because I well, the thing is, is the two guys that moved to my left just got moved into the table. And uh, with that in itself should have made me also uh, min open. And people, a lot of people saying, ah, you're two results oriented, Mike. You had 15 bigs. No, it's 15 bigs in the main event. They don't understand the difference. And a lot of them never will. It's just it's just not. Uh, well, well, it's the best way to say it. Well, I was talking to somebody. It's like a reverse ICM GTO type of event because it's just you're never short because the levels are so long, and uh, and I've I've always known it. And every year I've told myself I'm not going to bluff off my chips, and every year I've done it, uh, like at least the last three. And this year uh, I said I'm not bluffing off my chips. I almost did on. Day two, I uh, made this insane bluff, but my my image allowed me to do it, and uh, and then after that, I never really tried a really big bet bluff the rest of the time. Now I I I bluffed a lot of pots, you know, I I chopped up, but I, I you know I never was really risk. You don't have to make a big bet bluff in the main event. You just don't. It's the only event you don't have to. Uh, would you agree with that? Um, I think that's a. And again, no, too generic. Like, there's plenty of spots and plenty of people you can run a big bluff on the main. But, right. you know, when it's your stack and their stack, it's very different. And, you know, the few years I've gone deep in the main event, I got off to a good start, had a big stack, and then wow, I get to just difference. apply the pressure. And, you know, those, when you're betting for their term in life, it's way higher success rate than for your own. Right. Uh, when I said you don't have to bluff whatever, I'm, I'm basically was saying like if you don't get a big stack and you're just in the middle of the road, let's just say you're you're sitting on, I don't know, 30 to 30 to 50 big blinds for which is a lot in that event. But a lot of people don't understand. You don't need to run a big bluff. You know, granted, if you get off to a big start like you did, uh, it's it's kind of like the the one big hand I lost on on day on day five. If I win that pot, I have three point. I have one point eight. I would have it was two. I would have three point eight million in chips. Average was one point six, and uh, I would have been second in chips on the table, maybe first. And now it's game on. Now I'm gonna switch gears and listen. Uh, it's 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 fun to play with a big stack. I don't get it as often as you do because you're. You're much better at accumulating chips in and exploiting people in, in in spots than I am because you have played mass volume where I've played sixty no limit hold'em tournaments since two thousand and eleven. So, which is like definitely worth. Yeah, I think like you know you talk about sitting and waiting and figuring out the table. Is I'm raising and figuring out the table. Right. So if it's the right table to raise every hand, it works it out and chipped up a bunch. But if it's not. I chip down a little bit, but I also have the image of playing every hand that if I, you know, like I talked with Adam, like I just switched gears and started playing tighter for like an hour, but in his head, he still thinks it's been like the last three hours, you know? So if you, so rarely do people realize when you switch gears that quickly and as frequently as I do that like, all right, you know, I know I got caught bluffing three times. Now I laid off the gas and now I'm betting the same way, but I have it two times and now I have, you know, 30% more chips than when I started those three bluffs. And, right. you know, that's, I have such good instincts of knowing when people are in the mood to call me or not. Yeah. And that allows me post flop to, you know, get away with some stuff or to, you know, get value for a lot more chips than other people would. Right. And and that's where your talents come in. And, and, and one thing, uh, uh, Matt, you know, Matt Lance, uh, you know, he speaks very highly of you. And we, you know, he says, you guys are really good friends. And we talk a lot. And he's like, eh, Sean could be an asshole. But you know what? Sean Deeb is the greatest poker mind of our generation. That's what he said to me. And I, uh, I'm not going to argue with him. I, I, and, and talking with you and hearing that, what you've been saying, uh, you know, I've, I've always thought highly of you. But uh, you know, just hearing how you think is... Uh, People don't think like that. You know what I'm saying? They're always thinking about how great they are or this. And you're thinking about how, at all times how to exploit the next player, which is when you're on top of the game is uh, where you need to be. 
So, uh, you know, I respect that a lot. Uh, let's go to the next question. This was an interesting one I didn't know uh, nothing about. So you can answer this. Uh, this comes from uh, Brian, a man named Brian Lee from Twitter. What advice was Sean going to give Johnny Vibes when he wanted him to collect on their bet in person at the WSOP? I have no idea what that means, but you could probably answer it. <laughs> so I was basically like, he thought I was going to shit talk him, and I was going to say, congratulations, you won the bet. You know, we talked privately, and I said, your edge is a lot, is, my edge is a lot smaller than what you think it is and what the public perceives mm-hmm. for this bet. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, congratulations to you, but like, you know, don't take these results that you have because he'd cash like 30,000 and think that you're now a great turn player, like, or you're a great mm-hmm. poker player. Like, you still have so much further to go. Like, mm-hmm. you want to be, you know, a poker celebrity. That's what you're trying to do with your vlogs and shit. Like, just focus on that, you know. And I was going to pay him, like, here you go, you know, congratulations, you won. This is going to be great for you. You can springboard this, and, you know. And use this in your videos to, like, you know, make yourself come up better. Because, like, right. that's the whole reason he did the bet was for exposure, right. which is was a good marketing move by him. Right. But, you know, then all his antics and him and his brother talking shit about me, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, you won, congratulations, but, you know, I had a much better summer than you. But you choose the parameters of the bet to be very focused on you. You know, if we did the whole summer, we did all no-limit events, you would have lost. Right. You know. And so, he, exactly you know, for all, the people all, that... Aren't let that don't know what exact tell everybody what this bet was and what he won and uh, uh, I don't know what it was either I just I don't know so so Johnny Vibes is the first person who caused me to turn into the markup police right. he started advertising selling action at one point three eight for a package and you know he had very few term results he had very few poker results mm-hmm. and I thought it was a very bad buy and I thought he was taking advantage of his viewers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people, because he says he's a great player and says he's a great poker mind, but he's not. Mm -hmm. So, and he's playing against people a lot better than him. So he Mm -hmm. wants to, you know, talk all this shit. Uh, He's a deep sack cash game player and all this stuff, you know. For years, I've laughed at the cash game players say, oh, I'm a cash game player. I'm not good. Like, I'm better than the tournament players. We're so good deep stack. Mm -hmm. When all the equity matters in a tournament is the sub-30 big blind stacks. Right. I don't care how good you are at 100, 200 blinds. 90% of the tournaments outside, like, every tournament besides the main event, the average stack is going to get down to under 20 big barns, exactly. and the game is going to change drastically. And your sizings and your frequencies and your ranges are going to be awful. And mm-hmm. you're not going to know what to do blind versus blind on the button and all these things, when to shove, when to raise fold, when to raise call, when to defend, when to three-bet light, stack leverage. I mean, there's mm-hmm. so many intricate spots of tournaments that these cash game players will not know. And they're going to waste chips in raising and betting the wrong sizes and you know committing too much of their stack. So they just don't get it. This is why tournament guys have had success so much more than cash game guys in tournaments. Right. There's a reason for that. It's not because we're worse poker players. We're different. We're a different breed. Right. We grind out the small edges. We you know can't just sit to wait and flop a set versus some guy who's going to call you know 100 blinds with top pair. Right. When you're 15 blinds deep, it's not going to you're not going to flop a set of numbers top pair. Right. And they just don't understand that. And so. People like Johnny Vibes who just want to act like they're holier than um, everyone else in poker because they grind 510 cash or whatever stakes he plays, which I don't believe he plays 510, mm-hmm. you know, is just ridiculous. So all the shit that him and his brother were saying to me, I just want, you know, I you guys want to talk all the shit online. I'm willing to, you know, have a face-to-face conversation. You want to do all the shit and, like, you want to say that, oh, I wasn't going to pay and all this shit, like, so I didn't escrow, like, my reputation for five thousand dollars is pretty damn good. I think that <laughs> almost anyone who's in poker, this is this is like what's so ridiculous is like I you know I don't trust him. I don't know what money he has. He has to sell action for a twenty k tournament package. So I'm like, if you're selling for twenty k package, yeah, you're going to ask for a five k bet. Yeah, you, and yeah, me, I, I agree. I I play everything. You know, I've had results, uh, recent results, and like no one would ever question me for five k. So like, right. I asked him to escrow. And that was very simple. And I, I even told him in a message, I was like, hey, you know, we had another spat about a knockout, a bounty on each other. And I was mm-hmm. like, anytime, you know, you don't have to escrow, I'll always have 5K. I mean, if you knock me out, I'll just hand you 5K. Right. You know, it's the World Series. And so I'm like, I'm, no one's worried about me paying. No. So he want, him and his brother want to talk shit online like I wasn't going to pay and I didn't do this and I didn't do that. And I'm like, listen, man, you guys are new to, like, the high stakes poker community, but my reputation is pretty good. If I'm the guy outing everyone for owing money and being a scumbag, right. what do you think is the chance that I'm going to pull that off for 5K? Right. Like, what are the chances I'm going to pull it off for any amount? Like, you know what I mean? Mike, you, you know me, yeah. and 
you would give me every dollar in your pocket if I asked you for it. Absolutely. You hand it back whenever you need it. And Absolutely. Like, and that's a reputation I've earned. That's yeah. a reputation I've always, you know, had. Right. And, like, you know, for Negron to also talk shit about me being a cheater, you know, pissed me off even more because mm. – I'm the most ethical, honorable person of my generation. Right. I, you know, I am up front. I tell people when I can see their cards. I tell, you know, every time I see an exposed card, when someone fucks too high, like I do everything I've ever done to not gain an edge in spots like that. And that's something I pride myself on, which most poker players don't. I, so when people I'm attack my you. character like that, yeah. I'm going to agree with you on that. I, I've been, I, I don't know how many times we've played together where you're next to me and you've said, Mike, hold your cards down. I'm able to see it. I mean, it's one one of the kind of weaknesses I would have. Maybe I'm not quite, I'm focusing on the table, so I'm picking up my cards too soon or whatever. But I, I'd have to say at least three occasions you've said that to me. So I, and, I, and I say to people I don't even know. I say to right. everyone, like, especially when I, and the thing is, when I tell someone religious, I can see their cards and they don't correct it. Mm -hmm. You'll watch me. I'll actually turn my head 90 degrees yeah. to make it totally obvious that I can't see anything. If someone lifts up their cards high, you see me snap my neck 90 degrees the other way every single time because that's a, like I, I make money in poker. I don't need to do those little shit like things to make money. Right. Like I don't need to, you know, try to eye some because there's plenty of scumbags out there who you'll watch. Mm -hmm. They'll sit there with their hat down low and then when they adjust their hat down, they don't want anyone to see their eyes while they're trying to look at someone's next to their cards. Right, right, and I right. call them out for that religiously. I'm like, hey, you know, you need to take your hand. He's actually trying to look at it. Right. You know, and those are the things like I care about my reputation more than I care about making money. Right. And that's, you know, where, where when, I've always when been. you were younger, it was kind of the opposite. And, uh, uh, you know, like I, I'll never forget, like even when you played that ladies tournament, I said, Sean, that was a bad idea. I'm like, that's going to just. I didn't play that ladies tournament for the equity. No. I played it because we were drinking the night before and we talked about it. It would be a blast and it would be fun. I had more fun playing that ladies event than any other day I've ever played poker. Only one female at my tables mm -hmm. had a problem with me. And that was Alan Jeffrey Solomon, who shockingly has a problem with a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Oh. But I mean, like, uh, you ask everyone else at that table. <laughs> that is you know, so I, funny you brought up Alan Jeffrey Shulman. Now, she's been real nice to me the last three, four years, always coming up and saying hi. But, I mean, there was a time uh, when when actually was back in, I think it was 2014, uh, where she's the one that got me. A, I had grinded this. I had two and a half bigs for like four hours playing 08 stud eight. And next thing you know, I got six and a half bigs. And then I get it all in, in a four-way action pot and scoop it. And I slammed the table. And I said, that's right. I I fucking deserve this. I worked my ass off for this stack, right? And then she calls floor that I cursed and they give me a penalty for excessive celebration, which they knew that 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 penalty didn't exist anymore. And so then they backtracked and said, well, Alan Jeffrey Shulman said you were cursing at people and blah, blah, which was a complete lie, whatever. And it got me, oh, I, I had nine free hands in 08 and I just won this big pot. And you know poker is so much about momentum. So here I was like jumping around like now I'm, now I'm, now I'm one of the chip leaders and I'm like, and then all of a sudden they give me a penalty and you know me, I'm an emotional person. I start crying. I start going, I get so emotional. I'm like, you can't do this to me, whatever. Everybody was like sticking up for me saying how unfair it was. And even after I collected myself and I got, I thought when I got back in the game, I was going to be fine. I was just going to fuck them up really bad. Uh, I made a really bad call preflop and stud eight uh, that I would never do. And I got crushed in the hand. And next thing you know, I went on tilt. I, un I started thinking about what they did to me. And I came apart mentally and then got knocked out like 25th. And, uh, you know, so I, I've seen what she's capable of doing. So you're not, you don't have, you're preaching to the choir. But she has, she has been nice to me the last uh, three years. So, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. Maybe, she, you know, she knows I got sick and she felt, felt bad for me or whatever. But. Uh, yeah, she she used to not be the nicest person, so I could I could understand that. But when that you know you talk about your reputation being so much to you, and then Daniel calling you a cheater, that cheating thing, whatever that happens to do with what you multi tabling like fifteen years ago or something. Well, no, I didn't. I didn't even multi count online. Right. I never used someone else's account. Right. I was not one of those guys. That's what was so frustrating. Is like for him being the biggest voice in poker possibly mm -hmm. to say that on Twitter during an argument that he won't bet with me because he doesn't trust me that I'll, I won't cheat. And then he calls me the biggest angle shooter of art, my generation. I'm just like, 
that is the complete opposite of who I am. That's the opposite of how I carry myself. Mm -hmm. And, like, you're just saying things that are so wrong. And, like, you know, he has three examples in his head that he always mentions in the angle shooting. Mm -hmm. And those three examples, one of the three, he actually angle shot me. Mm -hmm. And he's the only person who's seen the footage who thinks that I was in the wrong there. Mm -hmm. And But he's, you know, a, one of those stubborn people who won't listen to anyone else besides himself. And and the other two... He is, like, very, he is very opinionated. That's true. Yeah. And, like, because of that, and all those hands happened over the last seven, eight years. And, like, he thinks that, A, I'm the same person, and, B, that, like, that defines me. And he's played hundreds, if not thousands, of hands with me since then. Right. And, you know, me and him have had an uh, on-and-again, off-again relationship. We've been close to talk, close -ish. Mm -hmm. We've been also very far apart. But now it's just, like, you say things about me that deep down you know are not true, just to fire me up. That just, like, shows how childish you are. That shows you how... You know, under my skin, under your skin, I am, and that you like are not a mature person. You're forty something years old, married. You talk about you know having a kid and all these other things. Like you got to grow up. You you're you're not kick poker anymore. You know you're a grown up. You're a successful man. You've made a lot of money. You're very intelligent, but you know you're still very immature in so many other situations. I I, I would I would agree with you in a lot of ways, but it it seems like now it's 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 fresh. That since he's been married, like even during the World Series, like he's a what been a different person. It's like uh, it, it, maybe Amanda fills the void that he needed in his life because he we've had you know we were at war for three years and and uh, when I released uh, uh, blockers for dummies and stuff right at the day of his wedding, a lot of people thought that that was out of line. And uh, listen, I just speak from the heart. I wanted you know. I was hurt, you know, we'd been best friends for so many years and for what had happened between us uh, to have happened. Uh, and yes, you could say it's, you know, about the money I loaned him, I, he loaned me and I had, yes, I fucked up or whatever. And I, when I explained that, but you know, it, no matter what he'll ever say, it was politi political and uh, it, it, it hurt, you know what I'm saying? And so I wanted to, to make a statement without kind of offending him. And you know what? The next day of after his wedding, like he was out partying, like with his wife or at the day of his wedding, 11.30 a.m. I get a text saying blockers for dummies. He said that was really, really funny and that, and you could feel that possibly that he felt, well, I know he did, that he felt bad that I wasn't there, that he made, he had made a mistake. And uh, and then we had a, a an, an interview with him, right, uh, pre-World Series of Poker where we, we put everything under the rug, and uh, and now we're 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 close again. And and, and you know, it's it's it, like you said, just off. You guys had an off again, on again, where you're close. Sometimes you're at each other's throat, or whatever. Um, and uh, you know that, that that's kind of sad. You know that happens, but uh, I think that uh, he might be growing up, or at least right now, why things are really good relationship wise. Uh, talking with him, he just recently he just seems like a different person now you know everybody goes through things and everybody most people learn from their mistakes it took me a long time to learn from mine and uh and when, when the people people think i owe the world a lot of money i don't owe very much money i owe i owe daniel a little bit of money and i owe one other person like fifty thousand. and and they know when i win a tournament or i pick off something they don't need to call me to pick up money i call them and say Hey, I've got money for you. You know what I'm saying? And and, and everybody in the poker world knows that. And uh, so it really did hurt me when, uh, you know, Daniel had gone public saying that I'm a criminal, a thief, whatever. Uh, and we, you know, like I said, now it's all under the bridge, so I don't have to, you know, talk about it. We talked about it on my podcast. And not like, it, like you said, nothing in the world ate at me more than when people are calling me a thief or a criminal. Because... I've never stolen a quarter from anybody. Now, in the poker world, people make mistakes. You know that. You know that that, that there's many times, many people that, that I mean, you use Chino Reem for an example that is a DJ and then he'll, he'll go off and blow money and he borrowed from people, but then he makes another score. And, and, and I, I, listen, I, it's tough. There's people who pay when they make money and there's people who avoid paying. Right. And they make excuses. You know, they're, anyone, I don't care how much money you owe me, if you see me, if I give me a couple hundred bucks, give me a hundred bucks, whatever, like, right. 
it shows that you're willing to pay the people who you see and it's like i don't got it for you i don't have anything you know like right. those are the people that you know are the scumbags yeah. like someone who you know, there's people you can tell to eat them up and i tell them a lot i'm like listen this money means a lot more to you than me mm-hmm. like you know we'll we'll square it up eventually and we'll settle you know right. but it's the people who have the money to pay you back and don't you know that's the people that really affect and you. I, and i and know who really and I, and and i'm not going to name names uh but i know i who those people are they've been called out a lot and uh it 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 bothers me too there's you know as well as i know when when you loan money to somebody or you stake people that are your friends or whatever you you want you're hoping they get on their feet and you get your, your money back but you're doing it out of the kindness of your heart out of you know, you're trying to help out a friend or whatever. And and, and that's just it. And then, so I never, I always thought if I ever needed to borrow a hundred, I, some people would be there. And then it went down to, uh, I couldn't even borrow 5,000. And the only thing, mistake I made was against Daniel. And uh, we've worked that out now. And he, it, the funny part about it is even when he w- we were going to war and uh, Phil Helmuth, and I had owed him 150 and Phil Helmuth offered him 120 for it. He turned it down. So he knew he was always, he's always getting paid because everybody, it's like Phil said, he said, Mike owed me 380000 I got every quarter of it. You know, I've never not paid anybody. If I, if I, if I would have won that stud eight or better tournament for four hundred, I would have kept 50000 and ran around and I would have got half and I would have paid out 150 to people I owed because that's what I do. So, um, so a good friend of mine who I respect a lot, um, is uh, and plays poker uh, wrote this about another good friend of mine uh, and you could give the answer to it it said it comes from Eric uh, Rodewig he says why were you such an asshole to Brandon Shaq Harris when he had a crocodile snout on last year (laughs) so you know I'm all for rules being enforced equally Mm -hmm. and so covering your face is an illegal rule so Brandon was doing that, and I was like, you can't do that. And he was kind of dick to me. He's like, oh, it's all fun and games. I'm like, no, but, like, if you get away with this and some guy can cover up his face and do all this other shit, I'm like, this is before, you know, the vulgar thing stuff. And I just knew that this face covering stuff had to be nipped in the butt right away. Yeah, so if someone wants to sit in an outfit, I called him out for it. And he wanted to be, you know, he thought we were friendly, so I shouldn't call the rules on him. And I'm like, I don't care if, you know, my wife's at the table breaking a rule. I'm going to call it out on her. This is the way I think all rules have to be enforced by everybody. But you, you know, uh, now that you bring that up, you, you made a point. You said we were friendly. Why didn't you just whisper in his ear? What I, I did. That's the whole point. I asked. I was like, you can't wear that. He's like, ah. And like he got offended that I even said he couldn't wear it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, he started making comments. And I was like, I'm going to call the floor and you're going to lose. He's like, no. And I was like, watch. So that was, you know, he got really mad about that. Right. And, you know, that's just, I, I like the f- rules to be enforced, and I know the rules, and I try to keep, tra- tackle, uh, keep mm-hmm. track of the rules, and I keep, you know, I'm very friendly with a lot of the staff, because I help enforce the rules when they don't want to be the bad guys. Right. So I tried to politely do it first time, and he wouldn't remove it, so then I had to call the floor for it. Okay. And then obviously the floor ruled that he couldn't, and, you know, and me and his relationship has deteriorated since then. It's been a lot of sarcastic comments, you know, different mm-hmm. things said. Publicly, privately, and you know that's kind of sad because you lose Bra- relationships in poker. Yeah, because Brandon Shaq Harris is really, I think, one of the good guys in poker. Uh, I, he, uh, that's that's kind of sad. I, 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 he's got a heart of gold, um, and he, he that that's sad. And hopefully, one day you guys will repair that relationship. All right, somebody wrote, "You stand out among pros. Your style is different." Please talk about. Ex- well, we've been doing this, I guess, but please talk about exploitive versus GTO and how these GTO guys will never win Player of the Year. Um, I think a GTO guy could definitely win a Player of the Year. If Steven Chidwick didn't have the high reward terms to play, mm-hmm. he'd be right there with me. He might be one of the few people who's had more tournament experience than me in right. the world. I mean, he's been a grinder, and I'm so happy to see his success. Yeah. So happy to see him get the respect he deserves for his, you know. Me too. Like, he had awful results for years when he was one of the best players ever. Right. So um, I think that – I don't think there's one can beat another, but I think exploitable play is always going to be more profitable in the softer fields. The right. thing is most of the public cities are high roller events where the exploitable play is not going to work against these GTO guys. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're you're not going to – at the final tables, you know, GTO is probably slightly better mm-hmm. than exploitable, but how do I get to more final tables than everyone else every year? Because I'm playing, you know – Hands up, no one else will open. I'm, you know, we've talked about this a few times. Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm convinced, you know, that I will take 
you know, a Phil Hamas for ROI versus a lot of GTO specials in the main event. Right. And Phil can get these fish to play terrible with them. He's going to talk them into folding when he wants to, talk them into shoving. Yeah. He's going to, you know, use all the things that the math equity side of poker isn't calculated. You know, libraries right. are very important. Mike knows this, I know this, and a lot of guys know this. And even like the GTO specials, they're trying to hold to not give off anything, but they're not trusting themselves to pick up reads. You know, I was talking with, um, this Brazilian pro in, I think it was the one, the one drop, like the rebuy one. Mm-hmm. And we were talking, and he's just like, I'm like, you're a great player, but you know, this guy just said something to you and like on the river and you didn't realize like he was block betting and he gave it away his strength. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, why do you not raise him? You're a top pair, second kicker. Like you haven't beat a hundred percent times. Like, well, he can't call. It's like, who cares? You know, you haven't beat raise min raise. Who cares how bad that is? They told you yeah, that like, or you told them that? They told oh, we were talking about the hand after the fact. I was right. like, why didn't you raise? Like, well, you know, I knew he was weak, and I was right. like, he was like, I just, you know, I thought there was no value in raising. I said, give him a chance. You uh, know, yeah. There's so many opportunities where people don't want to make a move because it's bad. Like, well, he can't call him with the worst hand. Yeah. Well, you're, if your opponent never has a better hand, give them a chance to make a bigger mistake. Yeah. And that's one of the things I do in poker a lot better than other people is I make bet sizes um, – that allow them to make mistakes. You know, I don't just have to do this one thing because it makes no sense. I'm like, if I think I'm the best hand, I'm going to consider raising Mm -hmm. and let them decide if they want to call me because that's some of the times where my image helps me out a lot. Right. Now, uh, yeah, that makes total sense. And, you know, when I was, uh, even when I was playing poker after dark last week with uh, Dario and we were talking about, uh, and Matt Berkey was in the game and we were talking about, um, uh, online versus live and me and dario said it's we're saying it's a completely different game and matt berkey was arguing it's the exact same game and i'm thinking to myself well now it's all makes sense now of why he hasn't been able to uh, win a bracelet when he plays so many events is because it if you if you are thinking that live is the same as Online. I know they're two different games. I've had two losing months of my life playing live, and I've had, I mean, I've lost millions playing online. And and granted, there's been many times I play too many hours or stay up for days or whatever. But but it, it, anybody that thinks they're they're not they're they're not two different games. They just are. You have to. I think they will merge to be the same game eventually. Right. Or a lot closer. But you know, we're still many years and many iterations away from poker style and the solvers to get to that point. Yeah. Now, uh, I br- I'm going to bring up something. Like, like uh, when I won NBC Ed up in 2013, I had talked to you, and we had, you know, I uh, so many people were saying, ah, oh, it's a crapshoot tournament, it's a crapshoot tournament. And most people were playing like six flips per an opponent, and I played three flips versus six opponents. Uh, and we talked about uh, stack sizing and, and, and how they were, this was before they've even moved to how many chips they're giving now. And you had said, you were one of the very few people who agree with me that, that it's more skillful playing, and this is, I guess, relating to what you talked about with the 30 big blind stack. It's more skillful playing short stacks than it is playing super deep. Uh, I've always believed this. Phil Hummick believes it. I don't know. Do you still believe that? Yeah, I definitely think that. I think, you know, because the mistakes you make affect your future equity so much more. Mm-hmm. If you're 150 blinds deep and you bleed 10 big blinds, mm-hmm. you're still 140 blinds deep. Your equity is not going to change drastically. Exactly. When you're 30 blinds deep and you bleed 10, that's a huge difference, you know. And because of the way, you know, a bet a couple of streets, it's going to be a couple of big blinds guaranteed each street. Mm-hmm. So it ends up being such a high percentage of your stack mm-hmm. that you need to think every single bet size so much more intricately when shallow you got you know you can set up to shove the river so much easier you can set up to set up to commit them on the turn while not committing yourself i mean there's so much more flexibility and you know creativity and bet sizing oh, i agree uh, with the shallower stacks i agree and and there's a reason and this is like uh I don't. I know you won your bracelet last year on twenty five k PLO. You were late res on day two. What is your opinion on late regging day two? Now, would you? I'm very big, a big proponent against it. I would like to see uh, during the World Series is is one of the times a year where you have to have late reg because people are going from tournament to tournament. But I just think that 
they're really hurting the integrity of a tournament when 75% are out of a tournament and you're able to buy in on day two with 30 big blinds. Now people will say, well, you have the same, you could do the exact same thing, Mike. Well, it's kind of different when I'm selling half of myself in markup and uh, I'm playing for other people. I can't just say I'm showing up on day two and playing. Uh, uh, Phil Helmut did it uh, last year when he got all the harassment with on the markup police uh, because he was charging big markup and showing up on day two. But and then I had brought it up to him. I, I agreed with people that that was out of line. And then he said to me, he specifically posted on the thing that I will be max late regging all tournaments. So that changed my opinion because if people know that, then then that's fine. You know, what is if if it was up to you? Would you do away with uh, re-entries and super max day two late regs, or are you for it? I think obviously re-entry super max late reg helps my equity more than most. I agree because I'm willing to do it, but I do think it's bad for the game. Mm -hmm. I do think you know so. going to freeze outs is better, especially when you you have two or three events a day. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why the mixed events were so great in, in years past the World Series is. People, when the structures were faster and you got less chips, mm -hmm. people would bust an hour or two into the tournament and be like, "Shit, now I have nothing to do all day." And they'd hop into the three, the you know, four, when it was noon and four p.m. the four p.m. mix game, or that or and cash so, like, game, you, you know, one of the two. Yeah, yeah. So that was like fine. I think that you know, going to stopping, preventing people from busting the first two levels of the tournament is so bad. Yeah. They've made nice changes in the the limit ones where you could actually bust in the first two levels. Yeah, it was great. And you saw people, you know, a better percentage of people bust on day one which means all the tournament entries go up yes yeah, it sucks for the one guy who flies out just for the 1500 stud eight right. but you can't change the structures for you know five percent of the field 95 percent of people playing are playing multiple events they're there for a week right. they're playing varied buy-ins they have enough you know bankroll to play it and I so it's fine and like Obviously, the people selling markup, your ROI is lower. The people bought in on day two of the main, no way their ROI is as high as people bought on day one no, for I the same skill level player. Yes, it's nice, but it's good to give them an option to play cash and come in a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And so it's fine the way, way it is with day two buy-ins, but they just got to adjust the structure. So you got to you know not you make it yeah. as incentivized. So they make them be a little bit shallower. But you know, make sure higher a little bit less of the field yeah. is in play. You can't let them be close to the money because then, you know, people max late reg right. stall and get in the money without playing well, a hand. Well, like last it year, in like the fifteen hundred PLO. And shit. Right, it happened last year. Somebody made a ten thousand dollar bet that they could max late reg in the PLO and and not play a hand in cash, and they did. And uh, that in itself is uh, shows you how bad it is, and and it's 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 pretty obvious that max late reg. Uh, and they, I didn't need uh, what's his name uh, from Australia to come out uh, with uh, with a with a chart that shows how much more your chips are worth. He's not from Australia. He's uh, you know from Europe. You're, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I'm blank. Yeah. Right the, now. Why can I think? Of it? He made the final table. And yeah. He's a great yeah, term. Really player. good. Really great. No limit player. And I was like, I didn't need his his uh, his his uh, chart to tell me. Uh, I mean, Space Gravy is his name uh, online. What the fuck's his real name? Dude, I'm. I'm you know, we're talking Kenny about. Howard's his Kenny, real name. Yeah, Kenny Howard. There you go. Kenny Howard. And so I go, uh, I didn't need to see the chart to know. All I have to do is watch who's being at the top. I mean, Phil, Max Late Reg, is, or now that now Day 2 Late Reg, Phil had 12 caches this year and two final tables. Uh, Chris Ferguson won Player of the Year two years ago, had 17 caches this year, and he three final tables. So it... It goes. Just, there's just no. What they don't understand is like, I start a limit tournament on now. The ones I really like to start on time is PLO eight uh, and the, game. yeah. I'll just because there's so many bad players. But you know, if you get a stack that that's really good going into day two. But you know, when they're letting people sign in with seven and a half big bets on day two in limit. People don't understand for the people out there, you could tell them how much is seven and a half big bets in limit. I mean, it's, it's a lot, especially the nine handed limit games. If it's 08, yeah. you know, or limit hold them, like that's so many hands. Or star, or how about study? No or the hands. annies are so small. Yeah. You know? And uh, it's just, that's, that's for a good player. That's two full hands to the river. Okay. And by the middle of day two, uh, 
maybe five percent of the field left, maybe less, has more than two big two hand two hands to the river. You know, I, I most people in the limit tournament are sitting between seven and twelve big bets for almost most of the tournament. Uh, and so when you're letting people, I think that's what you, I think that's might be the adjustment. If you're going to let people max late reg uh, in the PLO tournaments, instead of being able to buy in day two with 40 big blinds, uh, you, you, if you wait to day two, it's, you buy in with 15 big blinds. If you want to buy in day two, instead of seven and a half big bets, you know, you could, five big bets, you know, one hand, one, and you know what I'm saying? And I think that would be the adjustment that they need to make, uh, if they continue to do that. But, you know, in a real world, like you just said, and I've, and I preached it, it's not good for poker. We want to, we want to bring recreational players into the game. We want to people. So here, here's, here's a better solution than that. Mm-hmm. Actually, I just thought of in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, anyone who starts to turn on time gets, you know, 5% more chips or 10% more chips. Right. Well, we want to talk idea. about not enough people showing up on time to the tournament. Mm-hmm. You know, people talk about like Ari does rake free, but that isn't going to work for the World Series. No. So what you do is if you give those who buy in on time slightly more chips, right. that's going to incentivize everyone to show up on time. And then if you, you're getting punished for late regging. Yeah. And another thing, that's a good idea. And an, But another thing that I've been a proponent of for years, too, is, you know, back in the days, uh, especially during the split game tournaments, you wanted to show up on time because they, that's where all the dead money is. And um, now when if you show up on time in like there's a lot of people that satellite into some of these 10 K's or whatever, and they're sitting there playing four or five handed. Uh, for like 40 minutes and they're like, oh, I didn't sign up to play four or five handed and they leave the tables open and then the next thing you know, they they fill up and now they're high carding people off the table and the next thing you know is you show up on time and you're getting punished and getting moved to play with all the top pros that that late reg and I just don't think that you should be punished for showing up on time and whether it's, I'll stick with it to the day I die. If you if you show up more than two hours late for a tournament and they're starting another table, you all play together. If you want to play with it, you shouldn't punish people that show That's up on time. Right. But it's punishing people. As long as they do the table draws correctly, in theory, if they do it the way they, they used to do it, mm-hmm. which is there's a better system that they came up with this year, but what they used to do was draw everyone away and then move that table together. So you're actually, as an early guy, only playing with people bought in on time, mm-hmm. and then your table wouldn't break and wouldn't be in the draws for future tables. Right. So therefore, you're actually at an advantage when you do that. And the late rush people should get a chance of getting eat every table in the system. Mm-hmm. But the problem with that is then somewhere out of the way. But in the 50k this year, there's a thing that uh, Europe start EPT started. I think Kenny was the proponent of it, mm-hmm. where every table is in play and you draw a table number, not a seat number. Then they go to that table and high card. And then that high carded person goes to any of the open seats. Right. So therefore, you can't come look and see that there's three open seats with you know two fish on it each table, and then you want to play one of those three tables. Now you have a chance to get every table in the room, and then the person who gets drawn away from that table that you draw then gets the open seats. Gotcha. That's the fair system. It's a little bit more work for them. You and know, it's tough to do a bigger field, but like for all ten goes, I really hope that they go with that system next year uh you know pivoting over to the 50 case you know that people are like you know i knew the the uh, amount of people were going to be down this year i could just tell by a lot of things that were happening that it would be down it's one of the reasons why i didn't play and then i was looking at the field and i'm like thinking to myself uh where's the best field that's ever been uh, no, two years ago was the best field you were you were deep with me you actually i think you made the final table right when I got 11th uh, two years ago? I I got 7th one yeah. year when two, Daniel made it. Yeah, yeah, that year. That year. Yeah. yeah, that was the best field ever. We Oh, my God. We had so many business people. In the, but the, the thing is, is I, as I, I put out on Twitter, and I don't know if you'll agree, um, you need to, to, to improve the 50K, uh, what needs, the, the adjustments that need to be done. I think, I think they made a big mistake from going from, Eight handed to seven to six. I think it really should be seven handed. Now we we like six handed. That's fine. But to a lot of people, a lot of recreational people that were are thinking about playing, they don't like playing sh- super short handed. And uh, 
it it's caused a people to uh, a lot of the businessmen and and people who always play fifty k to not show up. I I think I I put on a twenty uh, an adjustment. I say go back to seven handed. Okay, pull uh, when the fifty k go back to fifty k late in the year. Okay, where. Uh, where it's prestigious. Remember where they used to sit, they used to have a whole rail railed off and they separated all the tables and spaced them out in the corner of the room. I say, yeah. yeah and I say, listen, and for the, for the 50 K to keep, you have to keep the prestige of it. You know, you need to show up in the first hour. If you don't show up in the first hour, you just don't get in because that's a tournament that, you know, is so prestigious. And by letting people buy in on day two of that event or they let people this year buy in at like 1025 on day two, I'm just thinking to myself, are you kidding me? You know, and it's just, and you know, my, our, my favorite joke is always like, hey, uh, are they in the money yet? Maybe they'll let them buy in when they're in the money, you know, and you, you can't. You, you don't want to hurt the integrity of poker. I think it's very important to, especially the 50K, uh, that's such a prestigious event and uh, in the mixed game world. And going into even like in the World Series, I guess, uh, you know, they could say the 100K is the most prestigious. I actually believe the that, uh, that 10K 6 max is probably one of the most prestigious no limit tournaments at the World Series. Uh if it's not. definitely about the toughest one of the year. Right. I think that that's the most prestigious, you know. Uh a hundred K you get a lot of pe- a lot of the very rich people that, you know, jump in it and and they're dead. But as far as like like field size and tough fields, I mean uh, this ten K six max is is uh, the toughest field I think. You know, uh but I want if you wanna if they need to they need to make if they want to keep the fifty K poker players championship a prestigious event, I think it's they need to go back to seven handed, spread the tables all out. Everybody wants to play, has to be there in, in the first hour. Then do you remember the rails we used to have uh that used to do yeah. walk, walk I, that, I, for I, the fifty K? I, I wanted to play that tournament so bad when I saw it the when I had a piece of Mike D. Michelle and he got second. Right. And they literally had the 10 tables set up and every big name pro, you know. Right. But I think one of the issues with the 50K is you look at all the 100Ks that are successful. The businessmen like quick tournaments. Right. But the 50K, you look at the final table every year, mm-hmm. the, biz- the businessmen have no shot. Right. Because it's a five-day tournament. The structure is right. too slow. If you want to have a higher reward tournament, you have to do a faster structure. The pros don't mind if it's a softer field to have a quicker structure. Mm-hmm. That shouldn't be a five-day tournament. People skip that term because they don't want to miss four days worth of other terms. Correct. Uh, that's another so, thing. It doesn't. Listen, they. I think it, they have. Uh, what were they? Ninety minute levels or hour and fifteen? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think, uh, 90, I think right? it was eighty this year. Eighty. Yeah. So I would. Uh, I would like to see. You know, for that tournament, uh, you have to show up on time. Uh, the first, I would like to see day one hour le- hour levels. Uh, uh, day two. If you're uh, hour uh, hour levels, day three, ninety minute, and final table two hours. You know what I'm saying? That would be fine, and have it a four day tournament. Or if they have it a three day tournament, go hour levels day one, uh, ninety minutes. Seventy five. Uh, yeah, seventy five, and then uh, ninety minute final tables. But uh, you're right. That's one of the reasons this year. Another reason why I didn't play it is I didn't like the field. I well, if I played it, I had to miss the 1500 PLO eight, which is the juiciest tournament at the World Series. I don't care what anybody says. You get a thousand people playing 1500 PLO eight. I mean, it's ridiculous. And then this year, they made the mistake of uh, I, I when they all those chips, the 25 K in chips in a PLO eight 1500 with a reentry, and I'm like, we're we're never gonna get this over. And then afterwards, I, I know I kept saying, how did this happen? What was the mistake? And they said, well, it was supposed to be like the 1500 PLO where 40 minute levels on day two, hour on day or on day one, hour on day two, which then made sense because they would have had 15 levels in on day one. And that's about what it took. We ended up getting in the money like 18, 19 levels in. And uh, if they had done the 40-minute levels on day one, like they were what they were supposed to be, they would have been in the money. Uh, I think everyone, pros and recs, like faster day ones. And I think the World Series absolutely. dealers would like that. The staff would like that. And I think you're going to see a progress to that because that's what people lose. Like, you know, when people talk about me repeating players here this year, I said, like, looking at the structures and looking at the chips, like, mm-hmm. 
I'm going to play five or ten less events than I played last year. Mm -hmm. So I can't just out-volume people like I have done in the past. I still played a ton this year. I multiple table a couple times. Right. Um, not with the success of last year, but like it's so much tougher because too many people were bagging chips every single day. Yeah. So, so all the term people yeah. are willing to play a lot of events, and they want, they're more likely to get a good experience. If they play four events than they play two. Right. Like you don't have to give them eight hours per buy-in, no. and that's you know the if, misnomer if, like, even in the no World series has right. Even in the no limits, if you're like uh, Maury even said to Jack, like why did you raise the chips from 50k to 60k in the main and he's like well we raised all of them from 50 to 60 for some reason there whoever has given them the advice and i hope they're not listening to alan kessler uh but I, I don't know why i have a feeling they they are because it's so many times it's an alan kessler structure but uh it's you don't need all these chips you need to listen i have no problem if you want to give somebody deep stack in the thousands and 1500 no limits you just change day ones to thirty minute levels. That's all, and and then day twos, an hour levels. You know, it's Matt. One thing to say, Matt Savage has had this down to a science for fifteen years. This is how the structures he structured every one of his tournaments. Uh, even even like you know, like the, the progressive blind levels work so well. Right, it's so good to have our like even in the ten k LAPC you now hour level day one, ninety minute day two. And two hours, uh, he went to two hours, days uh, three, four, and five. And um, I, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, I had a problem. This is my, one of my biggest problems about the late reg, uh, where they had the hour lo levels on day one and now 90 minutes on day two. Well, like we were just talking, if you're letting people buy in with seven and a half big bets and limit, and now you all those people that play day one at hour limits now have 90 minute levels, that's like having 11 big bets, or you know what I'm saying, or 10, 10, you know, it's, yeah. it's even more. So if they're going, I just think like nobody should be able to re enter a tournament where the level has gone from hour to. To 90 minutes but the late red should be cut off where they still have to play on a day when there's the hour limits like everybody else and uh like you said it, it is an edge for you it is an edge for for i mean even like the re-entries whatever like what we, we could we could you know daniel had a great world series but we could question what if they're not a re-entry and day two buy-in where daniel bought in with 25 bigs in the 100K, you re-entered, okay, and then got second. Um, that's where the edge is. They talk about they don't want people buying bracelets or whatever, but this is a bigger edge for the people that have unlimited money and or, or don't have any – you see what I'm saying, say? And, uh, yeah. and what, what, what's going to happen if it's, there's no day two late reg or re-entry? Daniel, who ended up making like a million for the World Series, would have lost 700000 at the World Series, even though he had a great World Series because he was he was blanking all the the big fifty and uh, the big buy in tournaments, and that's uh, that that's kind of like uh, and, and no, I'm not trying to disrespect him in any way. You know, he, he you know he goes by the same with same with uh, uh, Chidwig. I mean, he max late reg. Not only did he late reg day two, which he showed up at four o'clock on day two, uh, where he still had twenty five big bl big blinds in PLO, uh, and you know. When there's no any, how much twenty five big blinds is, and yeah. oh, eighty percent of the field is out, and that's just that's just something that needs to be fixed. As far I think you're right. If you're going to allow it, you have to put people in a less of an opportunity to win the tournament. You got to incentivize people to come in earlier. You do. Everyone has a better experience, and you got to do something to get people on time because, like, the single draw started three handed, and you know, at a bunch of tables and right. stuff. The staff knows they're going to get 80 people or 100 people. So they have to put six tables in the system. Right. So that way, you know, you're not just getting all the same cable. But it's it's brutal because there's got to be an incentive. And I know that World Series will never do a rake free. So mm -mm. maybe that higher starting stack would be the incentive I, that works. Yeah. And uh, everyone will be happy with it. Or even like in the 10Ks, like they're going to start you at 60. If you if you show up in the first hour, you get 70. Um and if you show yeah. up on day two, instead of seven and a half big bets uh, to start day two, you get 
five or four and a half big bets. Uh, you'll spend the day two registrations are not going to get there like they have. I mean, like uh, last year, even when you won, there was, uh, I, I, I had brought this up, that if you took the four biggest PLO tournaments, the 10K, the 25K, or I said uh, uh, the the three, uh, the four. Uh, yeah, the Omaha 8 and the PLO 8. Uh, th- three of them were won by people who bought it on day two. And in the 10K, uh, three of the six at the final table had bought it on day two. And that's all you need to know, you know. And, and, and you know, Daniel had said, uh, oh, it was just a coincidence. You're, you're way well, ahead. it's also slightly because of people maxly raising are the better players in the field. Like right. there's a little bias there. Because the strongest players tend to have be in a different tournament, be playing cash, or doing something else. So their their hourly is better spent elsewhere than day one of that tournament. See, so the people buying in day two, you look at the list, and it's the Bobby's Room Killers, right. you know, Helen Youth Negranu, myself, you know, right. some POI chasers. Like, So you're going to have a bias there in most of those events because some of the highest edge players mm-hmm. are reducing their edge by buying later, but they still have an edge. Right. You, all you have to do is look at caching. There's a reason why the people, like like if you look at the top five, probably top 10 people cash this year, uh, I'd probably say over 50% of them are people who max late reg every tournament. And it, and that's, it, that's, if you look over the last three years, that's enough of a sample size to know that something needs to be adjusted. And that's all. You know, and, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you agree with that. And uh, even though it's better for you, even and Daniel agrees with it too. He, he said straight out, he's like, He's like, I, I want to go back. I'd love to go back to the old ways. Is you start at noon. If you're not there by one o'clock, uh, you go to the next tournament. Uh, and he and he he's against re, rebuys. That he thinks they should all be freeze outs too. He says it's, it's better for poker, and, and and it's right. It's it's just better for poker. We have to do what's better for poker. Now, Savage yeah, says I'm a long term thinker for sure. And right. I completely agree. Like you know, me and Daniel are very intelligent and played a lot of tournaments and know. That because of our bankrolls, it gives us an edge to win more braces, to win player of the year more often. Right. The like other people are just drawing dead because they just can't afford to gamble in spots that we can. Right. And, and, and so when I, and that's good that you think that way. And even though it's a, an edge for you, for Daniel, whatever, you guys at least could come out and say that. Where when I bring it up to Phil, uh, he'll go crazy. Nah, you're wrong, Mike. You don't know what you're talking about because it benefits him, you know? And, even when I brought it up to to uh, Ferguson, uh, he did not say I'm wrong. He just said, "I hope they keep it the way it is." Okay, because he, uh, he, <laughs> he a very um, good answer. For yeah, because he know he he knows. And 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 then going back to when we were talking about the main event, I asked him because this is the first year you were allowed to buy on day two of the main event, which I think is. I mean, even Maury says it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, to to that you're really hurting the integrity of the main event, let, letting people buy in on day two, but whatever they whatever. And uh, but like you said, this I asked Chris Ferguson. I said, you know, you know, because of my health, I've been kicking it around of maybe buying in day two of the main with a uh, hundred bigs or whatever. He said to me, Mike. This is one tournament you show up on time for. Now, that's coming from Chris Ferguson, who max late regs every tournament. And it's what you related to earlier. The people who were buying in on day two is a big disadvantage in the main event. I 100% agree. You know what I'm saying? And when I heard that come out of uh, Mr. Math, Mr. Chris Ferguson, who understood uh, how much your chips are worth by max late regging and tells me be there on time, that was it. I was on time, you know. And uh, the, I don't, I, you'll, the very few people I... I don't know of anybody that registered on day two made the final table. Do you? I, I, don't, I don't know. I didn't like, talk to him at the final table. Yeah. I wasn't around. I mean, yeah. I was in other shit. So this is a really good question, for, and I know you have a great answer for it. Can you discuss the effects the Big Blind Annie has on structure and any changes to push fold ranges? Thank you. Big Blind Annie, I, I hate. I like the convenience of it, but I hate from a strategy side because my biggest edge was knowing the the bigger adding levels, the one six, the you know, when it's three six with a hundred dollar ante, you play so many more hands, and people were never adjusting properly to that. Okay. And also, if you were nine hander, ten hander, six hander, you know, the math of that, people were just playing poorly because the ante amount changed so frequently. I the agree. big line ante, it's standardizing the game and it simplifies it. 
everyone's going to know exactly what their 11 big blind shoving range is because every tournament blind level is the same. So it doesn't matter what level of tournament you are, you don't need to know anything different. Right. I think it messes up the final tables a lot because it overvalue it gives too much value to the big stack because they're winning such a high frequency of the hands of the final table, they're going to win too often. Okay. And also the big blind any the short the, the the people gain the most of big blind any are the shortest stacks and the biggest stacks. Mm-hmm. When you have one single any chip, the small chip in play, and you go all in, you get like twelve to one on your money, right. and you don't have to put a chip in for eight hands. Correct. So like Phil did the same thing in the big blind any, and when he was short on the final table bubble, and just they go to ten handed, you have one and a half big blinds. It doesn't matter. Like you get the cutoff, you have so long to you know, trip up your stack. Correct. And also, like, heads up and three-handed needs to be adjusted to be a small blind ante and heads up the ante. I agree with you. That's the only thing I, you know, I don't agree with Kessler on anything, uh, but I do agree with him on this. Uh, When it gets five-handed or less, I think it should go to small blind ante because you're basically... You're you're punishing the short stacks and re, uh, rewarding the big stacks, um, and it's one thing that uh, Matt Savage has, is is a little bit stuck on. He he thinks uh, the bigger the ante, the better it is for poker because it creates action. But for recreational players, uh, they don't they don't want to sit down and out on time, and they're sitting in a six hand a game when the, it's supposed to be eight hand a game and there's big blind Annie, uh, they, they, they want to be able to, and I, and I had said this, I said, I go, you want, don't want to incentivize action early on in a tournament by raising the Annie's because you, that's going to deter from the recreational players that like to just sit and wait on hands, you know, uh, like I, it, it, like me, I, I, uh, I know how to use my image and mix it up again, but I'm, you know, you play, we, we know you play a lot more hands than I, and we, or we talked about it on this podcast, uh, of why you're able to do it and not many people are. Uh, so I, I do think there needs to be an adjustment to a small, small blind ante when they get a certain amount. And that is why, uh, I will ask you this question, um, about the, this is the first year they use big blind ante and in the main event, uh, I, I asked Phil and a couple other people, I go, is it normal to just play five and a half hours and just call any rate? And not one of them folded one hand preflop at any given time for five and a half hours. And I just know that can't be right. And then Phil had said, well, the big blind ante might have something to do with that. And what's your 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 reason? Do you, do you agree with why that's why that happened? Yeah, I mean, they're getting too good of a price for two wider range. That's why when I was heads up versus Volpe, mm-hmm. I was 3Xing or 3.5Xing, even though we only had 40 or 50 blinds effective, mm-hmm. because I wanted him to fold some of the time, and I knew he was getting too good of a price to be min-raising or 2.5Xing the button. Correct. So it it just like, I, I understand where Savage is coming from. Mm-hmm. It doesn't induce action, but also with ICM, that reduces action. So he's trying to get an equilibrium. Mm-hmm. But it, like we talk about, I, I will take the big stack in a big blind any tournament, nine hands final table every single time mm. to win at obscene odds. Like that's why his son was able to crush right. because he had he could win so many chips and accumulate every time he sold the blind, he's getting so much when you're six and five handed where normally you'd be getting a lot less. Right. Yeah, I yeah, I, I agree with you. Like and if it's head up, I mean look how small the Annies would have been uh if it's not big blind Annie. You know, it's yeah. uh what they're playing when they're one in two million they have to. It's basically you're putting two big blinds out there instead of one and two million, and now you're putting a hundred uh, k ante out there or two hundred k ante, two hundred k. Yeah. So you're talking about the ante being a million. It's 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 it's, it's, it's it doesn't make sense. So I do agree with you. I I think they should go to a small blind ante. Uh, Party Poker did it in their big event uh, this year, and I remember Savage and Mike Sexton got into it on Twitter about it. And uh, and uh, they felt that was the right thing to do. Uh, it's the only thing I've ever 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 agreed with Alan Kessler about in any form of poker. Uh, so I can uh, <laughs> I'll agree with you. So uh, that's good. You know, it is convenient, but I, I do think it's an adjustment we have to make. Okay, last question for you: Can you discuss WSOP TD rulings over the years? Consistent, consistently bad examples of horrible, famous calls. Thoughts on recent calls. E.g. playing an extra day in the 10K uh, DC6 
or the Dario 1010 versus Queen Hand, Queen Queen Hand. I feel you both provide an interesting perspective. Uh, uh, the Dario versus Queen Queen Hand. Um, I think I, the Dario Hand Jack got a bad reputation for. I think everyone knows accepted action. You know, I I didn't watch the clip, but I heard that multiple players of the table told Dario that it looked like more than that. That it counts different. Mm-hmm. You know, I know that dealer feels really bad. They made a mistake, mm-hmm. but you know, once you decide to call, like you're calling the amount. We've all played poker where we dealer or player announced at that size that was different from what they actually had. Yeah, and, and I you know every time you pay the full thing, it sucks it's on that stage, you know. But I think, you know, you go from there and it's just something it's a learning lesson for everyone in poker. That wasn't a bad ruling from the World Series. No. I that's... think, you know, you're you're kind of just forced and it's one of the issues with so many chips. Like you're doing such large numbers. Right. That people are like the party poker event where you start with a million of chips. Mm. Why do you have to do that? Just to, it's such a stupid gimmick. That's people, dumb. especially people who don't speak English, to say four point seven million is very difficult for them. To say you know the numbers getting bigger are so much tougher it's on the so audience. Stupid. Understand the, yeah. the commentators and the players. And and the thing is, is like, like I tell people this all the time. Eighty-five percent of the population will never see ten thousand dollars in the in their lifetime. Okay, in one time, and when they see ten thousand dollar buy-in tournaments or ten thousand in chips, they're they're completely blown away. So by million dollar tournaments with five million in chips, or or like you just said, million in chips, it you don't need that. It's a, it's a gimmick. It's bullshit, and all it does is make things harder on the dealers, make things harder on every all the players, and it's just so many mistakes happen because people miss them out. They say. Two point seven thousand. They met. You know, they, there's so many issues that come up that are flaws in that that many chips and that big of numbers that it's just silly to make it that difficult for people. Where you lose the conversation of poker, people are not willing to announce a bet size and talk because they're just so confused that they don't want to miss a mistake that right. they're just like sitting there fumbling the chips and everyone's playing slower because they don't want to miss click because the numbers are so goofy and so large. Yeah, me and Dario talked about this hand. Uh, at Poker After Dark last week, and uh, and I I knew what his answer was going to be. He agrees. There's not the, there's nothing wrong. He wasn't upset about the ruling. His his problem was is is you know, and I feel bad. He and I do believe him because I had I had even said it on one of my, on my uh, Twitter or podcast or whatever that as a poker player, I'm eighty percent sure if he knew it was five million more he would fold those two tens because that's 10 big blinds, 10 big blind. Dario understands what 10 big blinds is in that tournament. And so when we talked about it at poker after dark, he said, Mike, I'm not going to lie to you. If I know, it's, if I, if, it, if I know it for sure, it's 22, five, I 100, not 80%. I 100% would fold because those 10 extra big blinds is so much. I could find a better spot than play a flip. You see what I'm saying, and that's and and I believe him, you know, and it's it's kind of unfortunate that that happened. Uh, but his his biggest problem, more than anything, was, of course, what Jack said to him, which was so out of line, which was, oh, if you're calling seventeen and a half, you're calling twenty two point five, and walked away, and that was out of line. And Dario, everybody was convinced that Jack owed Dario an apology about it, and and he gave it. No, he didn't. Oh, I was told. I, I heard he came and apologized. In that. He didn't he, apologize he to Dario. He apologized of. He just apologized to everybody left in the event of how. But he didn't actually walk, apologize personally to Dario, saying I apologize for how when I said if you're calling seventeen and a half, you're calling twenty two and a half. That was out of line by me, and I apologize. And that's the only thing Dario said he wanted an apology that he never got. And so. Uh, that's what he told me. So uh, that's what bothered him, I think, more than anything. And so I, I gave him my opinion on that. So uh, do we have any more questions or are we good? All right, we're good. All right, well, um, we could uh, we'll talk about one more thing, I guess. Uh, will you, did you like the markup, Police? I loved it. You knew I would love it. I knew you I would love it, too. It took so long to come out. Danny, I know. get your shit together. No, uh, hey, Danny, tell him, Danny. This is my editor. Uh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what happened was, is, is we, we, we were getting so many views. He had, we had to keep getting the, I had to get the tournaments out and he, uh, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of work, you know, but once it got out, my God, I mean, people loved it more, way, more than they liked, uh, 
uh, Blockers for Dummies. I mean, uh, they're both were great. I mean, Blockers for Dummies was perfect because of the, the day I released it, <laughs> and and I, I I didn't I just thought you know and and your tweet was amazing. Like I've never followed anyone on YouTube, but uh, this is pure pure gold. And I and that's what I wrote out to you. I go wait till you see the one next week about you. But I knew you wouldn't be offended by it. And I, and I and if you told me that it would bother you, I. I would respect you. You know what I'm trying to say? Same with, with the Daniel uh, Blockers for Dummies. I made sure to not... I want it to be funny, but I don't want it to be something where I'm make, trying to make somebody look bad. I want you, don't, to, you don't want it to be controversial. You want it to be humorous. It's obviously it's satire, correct. and that's what you know. the people need to realize. It's like you're going above and beyond. You know, I did right. the same thing when Daniel got married. I want to make a joke about like anyone doing anything fun today, you know, shit like that. Cause right. It's like, dude, that was the funniest me. The fun that was the one with you and Polk hanging out the window. Is that the one? Yeah, that was fucking <laughs> Someone great. Someone put that in one of my chats. I had to post that. Dude, one. that was that was so fucking funny. You know, hey, uh, that's great. Uh, we 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 didn't talk about too much about your chase for a second consecutive WSOP Player of the Year, and uh, why don't you tell? Uh, my listeners, like what it would mean to you to win a second consecutive player of the year. Um, you know, I got into poker. I love volume. I love leaderboards. You know, I mm-hmm. start grinding tournaments because the poker starts tournament leaderboard. Mm-hmm. I've always cared about every player of the year of, you know, scoop, W coop world series. And some of my close friends have one player of the year and they always give me shit. Cause you know, I was always more of a favorite than them. I grinded more tournaments, whether it was Casella or, you know, right. um, Ben, you know, Ben Lamb. And so finally to match up with them, and I really just want to pass them so I can rub it in their face. Because, yeah. you know, I think player of the year shows the grind, shows the mental strength. It's not just running good to win a bracelet in one event. Right. You know, it's not just sucking out. It's consistently results. It's consistently showing up. It's playing it's putting, every, you know, every game. Yeah. It's playing every – you can't – you know, they're, they're, you know, they're talking about putting in a bunch of more high limit, high rollers and tank uh, – for uh, so no limit people can win player of the year. I I – disagree with that i say it, it's not it's it's player of the year not no limit player of the year so correct. you know to be the best poker player you have to play all the games of poker agree yes no limit's a huge component of it right and yes you know it's difficult formula to come up with because the to win a bracelet or get the deep run no limit is so much tougher than you know a 10k mix event right but you gotta balance it out so but like they're gonna end up always with you know the person playing more tournaments so whether you just play no limit you're only playing half the events of the summer. It should be tougher to win player of the year playing half the events than someone playing all the events. I agree. And 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 if you notice, you know, a lot of the no limit players are jumping in on the 10K mixed events because they're trying to learn. Listen, I I I learned all the games playing four and eight hundred. You know, it cost me money, a lot of money to learn how to play all the games. You know, a lot of you know that was probably a big mistake. You know, I could have easily done it playing uh, thirty sixty or whatever. But everybody. You have to put in the volume and the hours to get good at all the games. And if if these players want to win Player of the Year, they can't just sit there and say, and I'm a, oh he's a he's one of the best players in the world. No, he's one of the best no limit holding players in the world. You know what I'm saying? If you're happy with that title, uh, that's fine. You know, I want to be known just like you as somebody. That like I've got four bracelets in four different games. Okay, uh, not many. There, there, there's probably less than ten people in the world that could say that. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, there's not that many people that have four bracelets, but probably less than five people in the world that I don't even. I might be the only one. I don't even know. I have I haven't looked up. I don't know. Do you yeah. count no limit hold them and pot limit hold them as the same game? Uh, nope. Those are two different games. All right, we're tied. <laughs> okay, there you go. So, uh, you know that. I credit myself on that because not only, okay, have I won a no limit holding bracelet? I won a no limit deuce to seven bracelet. I won, I'm the only guy in history that's won the 08 and stud eight uh, championship, which means a lot to me because you know, I pride myself on the split games. You know, that's where I believe yeah. I'm, I'm one of the best in the world in. And uh, to, to have done that in four different games means a lot to me. Uh, when I was playing the dealer's choice and I finished fifth uh, two years ago, uh, or it was three three World Series ago now. Uh, I mean, I was devastated. I, I I grinded the one and a half bigs all the way to chip leader, but by the time I did that, uh, the limit had caught up with everybody. Where 
the mistake I made is everybody was shallow. And once I got into the chip lead, I should have fucking, when I, it was time to, to change, this is the mistake I made is the time to change games. I should have changed to limit hold them or no limit hold them. Okay. And instead, because we were playing the, the high, low regular and the PLO eight and everybody was picking this because, you know, nobody was, everybody got shallow. I didn't make that adjustment. And all of a sudden, you know, I lose one pot and the limited caught up to everybody. And I'm, I, I ended up grinding from one and a half bigs to chip leader to end, ended up finishing fifth anyways, which I could have done 10 hours earlier. And it was pretty kind of devastating. And it was a dealer's choice. And uh, it's kind of like what we talked about earlier is, is I, in my, as far as I'm concerned, uh, yes, the 50K is probably the most prestigious mixed game tournament. But I think the dealer's choice is, is the most prestigious and to watch that fucking, and he's a good friend of mine, so I'd like to fuck with him. To watch a guy, to watch Adam Freeman win this thing back to back and have to hear about it from him for the next, how many years are we going to have to hear about it? It's okay. If I go back to back player of the year, that'll quiet down his back to back. Exactly. <laughs> the years. So exactly. That's my, that's my way to shut him up is offer him heads up and then, you know, show him what a real back to back is. Yeah. And, and listen, you know, you hit it right on the nose. People, including me, do not give Adam Frieden enough respect. He does a lot of great things. Is there some things that, that he could fix that would make him a much better player? Of course there is. Uh, same with Helmut, same with, same with everybody. You know what I'm saying? Uh, when you're on the outside, somebody I can look at certain players and I know their deficiencies in what game and where their weakness is, just like you're able to do. Um, and it's th- those people that, a lot of them that don't see their weaknesses in these games and think they're so great or whatever are the people that that fail. Where you were able, like you told me, I used to uh, analyze this, I used to do this. And you know what the truth of the matter is? When I was first coming up, I did the exact same thing. Like back when the World Series was going on, that's why I like the te- playing the 10K mixes, is those are the same 100 to 150 people every year. And it's like a family kind of thing. Everybody's needling everybody. It's and that's what the World Series was at the Horseshoe from forever, from at least from when I started playing in 1996 till they moved it in 2005. I mean, we had the same, the first five, six years, it was the same hundred of us, you know, at, that were playing. Most, like back then, we were all, the cash games were where it was at. It was like you, people would bust out of the cash game, jump in the 4800 horse game, or at the time we played a lot of HOE, hold them on my eight, stud eight. And, uh, and when they would uh, bust out of a tournament, I'm like, oh, yeah, right? And whether it was Sammy Faha or whoever, and they jump in, and it was like a free 20 dimes. I mean, that's the thing of why the World Series needs to work on a quicker structure early to either get them into other tournaments or to get the cash games back at the at the World Series. They don't need to be at the Bellagio and the Aria if they— Well, the thing is, you need the tournaments and the cash games in the same room. Yes, I agree. That that's the biggest issue is the Amaz the room where day threes and all that stuff is mm-hmm. should be there. Payout should be there. You should make it so they don't have to go out one room into a different room to get paid and into a third room to play cash. If it's all in the same building and the same four walls, you're gonna get people to stay within those you know, walls that, a lot more. That's a and good you need idea. better food options. Like there's a lot of things to make it more comfortable there. So if they, chairs, if, you know, if yeah. they move like the day two or the day uh, they moved the the like the Leon's room, okay, to okay, yeah. to let's just say uh, the corner of the Amazon, uh, and they rope it off for high limit games, uh, and and they advertise that the only only the top dealers are going to be dealing in the high limit cash games, and you're going to be able to get these nice chairs, and they advertise it, and and they get their money wired to the World Series first, and then when they bust out, they're going to go right over those high limit games. And I think that's a great idea of, of, because we, it's really important. See, right now, it instead of going, get knocked out of a tournament and jumping in a cash game, they're getting knocked out of a tournament and going into another tournament. Or if they get uh, late or whatever, they wait the next day or whatever. But it, to, I think they could bring the cash, the big cash games back to the World Series. They just have to market it right. And, you know, you you might be onto something, you know, putting it in, where the day three tournament games are. Because I would never, like, if I get knocked out, like, when, when I'm walking, like, oh, let's see what's going on in in uh, King's room over here. 
you know, and walk into it. That's a long walk into another room, especially after you bust. You know, you don't, it's the yeah. least thing you want to do, you know. But you want to get the people when they bust out of a tournament to, to, to jump into a big cash. And they used to do it all the time. I mean, I would, I can't tell you, I, there wasn't a World Series went by that I made less than 300,000. And that was, and I didn't play that many tournaments back. The per- tournaments weren't, didn't become big till the moneymaker effect. So uh, it was always, and even then, it, tournaments really didn't really get, where they are now, where there's three a day till what five years ago or whatever. So yeah, you know. I mean the three days is too much. Yeah, and and the thing is, is it, and, and and Bryn Kenny said it to me this year, and I he's I put him you know also one of the top five you know tournament. He's an amazing player in all games, uh, and he come to play the stud eight or better right, and then uh, he signed up on day two, and he uh, and kind of like what we were talking about, and he won the first pot he played and the next one the next thing you know, i look over he's got two hundred fifty thousand in chips and i had played a whole other day and i had 150 so uh you know i think you're right i think uh, if you're going to sign up from day two we have to uh make a adjustment where you don't have quite as many chips and uh like also he's like man mike i'm like he goes he goes this is crazy this is the grind of grinds he goes I, he goes i can't be playing grinding like this four day tournaments i go well yours is only three he goes still this is this is i would have never signed up if i knew it was like this and listen i understand for the poker go they wanted to make uh 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 the day four for a stream table but then they go and what they did to you and add uh what they did to you guys on day three knowing that it wasn't going to be streamed to have you guys stop like they did was horrible you know and, but then when I but then then in this stud eight, they said, uh, "Well, this is not going to be streamed." So uh, the night before, they said, "Okay, tomorrow we're playing down the six people on day four Is and and so then we get there. They said, "Oh, because it's not being streamed, uh, it's we're playing it out today," which really pissed me off. And I really worded it because, like I told you, my my dad was really sick for a long time and. I was 100. Once my chip stack, I was like, unless I grenaded it, I was pretty locked to make the final table. And I was expecting, you know, where my my dad, my family could come down and watch. And then they said, well, we're playing it out. I go, well, that's really not kind of fair. I'm like, I, I have like three or four people that I told that that want to, you know, watch me at the final table. You guys said we're playing a six, and now you're changing your mind. You know, it kind of upset me. You can't. The, the night before they like the 08 tournament, we played till like an extra hour like three thirty in the morning so they started day three at three in the afternoon okay now the stud eight tournament we did the exact same thing and then they said no you got to be here too and it's you know as well as i do if like even when they ended at two by the time you got let's just say you're staying at, at, at frank's house or at my i'm at my house by the time you drive home by the time you unwind uh you, you're not getting to sleep till a minimum of 4 a.m. And if you have to be back there at 2, I mean, the latest you could wake up is 1230. You see what I'm trying to say? And it, it's tough to, yeah. you know, like the days I got six hours sleep, those are the tournaments I went deep in. The days, and there was some that I got less, but I still went deep in. But but there was many tournaments I didn't sleep well, and I played, I didn't play my best on a day two. And uh, I just, you can't, one of the biggest problems out of the World Series is they... They, they make a rule one day, this is how it's going to be, and now all of a sudden, three days later, it's another ruling. And it, it just needs to be a little more consistent. But they do a good job in overall. They, it's, a, it's a fucking, you gotta understand, you know, you know how hard it is to run a tournament that magnitude. And, I, I know how difficult it is for them, and I, they're understaffed, and they're, you know, the problem, you know, it's just, they're in a bad spot. They can't right. make everyone happy. But they have to do what's best for long term, and they have a lot of short term mindsets. And the numbers are up, and they're doing great. Right. But they're gonna, you know, it's gonna have a steep, steep decline really quick. Right. When people get over, you know, a lot of these things. Thank you, thank you. That's and, and we're gonna end this uh, this interview on that note because this is what I'm gonna keep pressing on my podcast on Twitter is yes, they're making more money now. They're getting the the buy-ins are up. But there's going to be a crash because I know what where the poker world stands 
as far as how the cash games are dead. Uh, people are playing tournaments because they're trying to make a score because there's no money in the cash games. I mean, my good friend Mike Wattell, and I talked to a couple other people, I, they say he says the cash games were 100% worse than he's ever seen them in any other year. And he was playing the 2-4 mix and the 4-8 mix. And then you see a lot of the, the uh, this was the first three weeks of the series, of the, the two, 4,000, the big guys were all playing all tournaments. I'm like, what's going on? I'm like, and then they were all saying the games are just not very good. Now I heard they, they got real good at the end of the world series, but uh, they were just not very good. At, and so everybody was playing tournaments. So this is going to continue to happening and they need to do something to, to keep the ecosystem of the poker world and the money coming in because it will dry up and only a certain amount of people are going to be able to ante up. And I want to do help what's best for poker. I think you want to also, which is why you said uh, what you said about when I asked you about re-entries and late uh, day two re-entries. And these are things uh, that, that need to be addressed hopefully by next year and make the poker world a better place. Sean, I appreciate this interview. It was great talking to you. Um, I think everybody uh, that follows me is going to really enjoy this interview, and it means a lot to me, and I thank you so much. Happy to spend time with you, Mike. You got it. And hope I you, need- hope your performance feels better, and I hope to see a battle with player of the year for me next year. You got it, buddy. And if I can get healthier where I can put in the volume, you know me, <laughs> I will. Take care. All right. Say hi to the family, and I will see you soon. The Mouthpiece. Hope you enjoyed episode 14 of The Mouthpiece. And I hope you enjoyed our great interview with Sean Deeb. And we wish him luck chasing his second consecutive player of the year. Tune in next week for episode 15 here on The Mouthpiece. Take care. The Mouthpiece.